All right. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you happen to be in the world uh, currently joining us. Uh, this is uh, Adding Style with CSS Jumpstart. Uh, I am uh, Christopher Harrison, and uh, I'm uh, joined today by uh, Helen Zhang. Uh, Helen, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, much like Christopher, I work at Microsoft, and I am a startup developer evangelist working out of San Francisco. So I. So I work with uh, top tier startups out of the Bay Area to basically help them onboard onto Azure, um, help them develop great apps for our platforms, and I also, you know, just generally spread the word of BizSpark, telling startups about how they can get access to software and services from Microsoft. And in my spare time, um, I'm a volunteer CS teacher, and I guess both in work and in life, I'm a really huge JavaScript junkie. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> well, welcome, welcome. Um, and uh, as for me, I am uh, Christopher Harrison. I'm a uh, longtime MCT, spent about uh, 15 years as a Microsoft Certified Trainer. Um, and uh, recently, about uh, six months ago, actually, uh, Microsoft said, hey, you want to come work for us? And I said, eh, sure, why not? And so uh, I packed up the family, uh, moved up here. I actually got started with uh, technology back when my father uh, brought home a, a VIC-20, graduated on a Commodore 64 best OS ever. Um, and uh, basically, I've just uh, kind of turned that into a career. Um, I'm a content developer focused mostly on uh, Office 365 and uh, web development. And then uh, outside the office, uh, you can find me uh, out running somewhere, spending time with my wife or uh, four-legged child. In the meantime, uh, let's go ahead and uh, talk about what we're going to talk about. Uh, so we've got uh, six modules today. Uh, and uh, module one is sort of the ubiquitous getting started with CSS, where we want to talk about what CSS is, the basics of how to apply it, how to bring in external style sheets, and so forth. And then that will lead us very naturally into module two, where we're going to take a look at how to identify uh, individual elements or individual uh, blocks of, uh, of elements. Page three is going to be, or uh, page three, module three even, is going to be page layouts. Um, and uh, that's where we're going to talk about really just how to lay out your pages, how to put uh, different things into different spots, how to handle positioning, and how to handle uh, the, uh, the boxes as they work inside of uh, CSS. Module four is going to be uh, media queries and focusing in on how to automatically resize things uh, or make things show, make things hide based on the size of the uh, based on the size of the display. Make sure that uh, you know when you're going in and designing everything that it will actually work on a uh, mobile phone, uh, for example. Uh, module five is going to be transitions, transformations, which is going to be a lot of really cool things that you can do with CSS, not JavaScript, as far as making things kind kind of um, highlight or move things around and so forth. And then finally, we'll close it all off taking a look at CSS preprocessors, because one of the things that uh, you're going to notice is that CSS can sometimes be a little bit verbose. Is that a, a good way to put it? Uh, yeah, verbose, and I would also say finicky, for sure. <laughs> finicky, finicky. <laughs> I, I like that word, finicky. Um, and so the preprocessors are there to, to try and, uh, and help you out there. Cool. Now, uh, now that we've talked a little bit about us and a little bit about what we're going to talk about, let's talk a little bit about you and kind of um, what the expectations are. So we sort of expect that you've done some level of HTML. Uh, we're not going to teach HTML today. Um, and we also expect that you've probably done maybe a little bit of CSS, that maybe you um, kind of opened up Bootstrap and went, oh, what in the world is this? Um, and are trying to figure all of that out. Or maybe you're, you're supporting a site and you're just trying to kind of navigate the land. So maybe you've played around a little bit with CSS, but we're not setting a very high level on CSS knowledge, that this really is going to be um, an introduction to CSS. And also along those lines, it's definitely worth mentioning, we're not going to cover every last CSS property. We would be here all of today and tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that and probably the day after that trying to cover all of the individual properties. So we're not going to do that. So we really are focused in on some of the bigger properties and really a lot of how CSS is going to, uh, is going to function. Because that's the stuff that, uh, that you really need to kind of learn. The individual properties, that's a lot of key value pairs that you can go look up later on. So that's really going to be our, uh, our focus. 
If you are looking to dig a little bit deeper or to try and find a little bit of prerequisites, I would recommend the HTML5 CSS Fundamentals uh, MVA that uh, Bob Tabor did. And then there's also a Microsoft course 20480, which is programming in HTML5 with uh, JavaScript and CSS uh, that, uh, that you can check out. Uh, beyond that, uh, since you guys have uh, joined today, you're a part of a 2.5 million user community, uh, which is pretty cool on uh, Microsoft Virtual Academy. Uh, it's a great place to go in, find all sorts of uh, great training. Uh, you can uh, earn your 50 points for uh, watching this. You'll notice the uh, their Azure code and then um, uh, the uh, little URL that you can go to to uh, punch all of that in. Fantastic. So. What do you say we uh, actually get started? Yeah. All right. Cool. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, at CSS. There's the camera that I want. Let's take a look at uh, at CSS, and now he takes it away and uh, talk about exactly what CSS is uh, is all about here. Uh, so we're going to start off with kind of what CSS, why you want to use CSS, um, what uh, what's important about it. And then we'll roll on into uh, element selection. We'll actually spend a lot of time uh, today, both in this module and in the next module, talking about how to identify uh, individual elements, how to identify types of elements, how to identify elements based on their state, where they happen to be, and so forth. So that way I can say, hey, this is how I want you to display. This is where I want you to display. Maybe I don't want you to display. Things like that. So we'll go in and take a look at, uh, at all of that. We'll take a look at the different ways that we can actually apply CSS to a page, and that will actually lead us perfectly into CSS inheritance. Now, chances are you've checked out another MVA, and one of the things that you've probably picked up about MVA in general is that MVAs do tend to be demo heavy. Today's not going to be an exception to that. We are going to have an awful lot of demos because you're a developer, right? Yes. And I'm a developer, and you're all developers. And one of the big things about being developers, we need to see it. Yeah. You know, you need to actually see how it works. So there is going to be a lot of demos. The one little catch that we're going to have a bit this morning is there's a little bit of groundwork that we need to lay out first before we can get to a demo. So if you're sitting there and you're watching and you're going, hey, can, can we see a demo? Trust me. There's going to be plenty of demos. We'll get there. It's just going to take a couple of minutes to kind of roll through a little bit of background stuff first. So cool. Let's get in and take a look then at what CSS is all about. So CSS, of course, stands for cascading style sheets. All right. Well, the cascading part we'll talk about in a few minutes. Let's focus in on the style sheet part for right now. The style sheet part is this is a language that we can use now to lay out whatever it is that we might want. And of course, the most natural coupling is with HTML. Now, you might be wondering, all right, well, wait a minute, Christopher. I could actually fire up HTML, and, and I could actually just say something like this, that maybe, uh, do, 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 do. actually, apparently, I'm going to do it this way, because I don't have Zoom it started yet, but that's OK. So maybe I could go in, and I could say bold, and I could say hello, like that, and I could close off my bold tag like that. Well, that's style, right? Yeah, I mean, it'll make the hello bold. It'll make the hello bold. But is that a really good way to do things? Uh, not if you want to, for instance, repeat this or you know, apply to a couple of different elements. Absolutely. Or if you want to change it, even. Yeah, that's exactly it. Because what we've now said is that hello has to be bold. That's it. And, and so the first big problem is, what happens if you want to change that? Or what happens if you want to be able to change that based on the device? So maybe I want that to be bold on uh, a mobile phone, but I don't want that to be bold on a desktop. Or maybe I don't want that to be bold when it's printed out. Well, I've said this is going to be bold. That's it, period. End of discussion. There's nothing else that that's going to be but bold. The other big problem that I have is, have I told you anything else about this little hello? Do you know anything else about that hello? Nothing. Nothing. You know that it's going to be bold, and that's it. Yep. Is that a title? Is that a greeting? Is that a header for an article? Yeah, I kind of think it's important, but even that, I mean, I'm not sure. Exactly. And that's the problem. So you don't know if it's, if it's important or not. I don't know if it's important or not. The browser isn't going to know if it's important. The screen reader isn't going to know it's important. And a search engine 
isn't going to know it's important. That obviously a lot of time is spent on SEO search engine optimization, and SEO is extremely important. And one of the things that I always try to highlight is if you're doing good things, that's going to naturally start to move your page up. You know, a lot of people spend time focused in on performance, and, and performance is important. But really, if you write good code first, you're going to find more often than not that the good code is the best performant code. So if you just focus in on, hey, how can we make this code work really, really uh, well, read really well, that's generally speaking automatically going to be the fastest way to write it. Same exact thing when you're talking about search engine optimization, is that if you design your pages well, they're typically going to be optimized in search engines. Why? Because the search engine is going to understand what that page is about. So if I can tell a search engine, hey, that's a header, it now has more information that it can operate on, and it has a better understanding of where to put that page in regards to, or in relation to other pages for particular queries. So not only do we want to focus in on this is how we want to display it, but we also want to focus in on exactly what that information is. And that's where that separation of concern comes into play. So rather than just simply saying, hey, we want this to be bold, let's let HTML put together the structure of the document. So let's let HTML tell us this is what the head is. This is what the article is. This is what the section is. This is where our navigation is. Let HTML do things like that. And then let's let something else handle the logic. That's, of course, going to be JavaScript. And let's let something else handle the formatting and display. And that's where CSS is going to come into play. That nice, clean separation of concern. So rather than going in and having a bold here, maybe we go in and we use a header tag. Or maybe we go in and we do um, an H1 tag. And I understand that H1, of course, is going to give you formatting. But H1 is still going to be understood as that's a header. And we can, of course, take that with style and adjust that. Yeah. So yeah, so focus our HTML on describing our data focus our CSS then on how we want to display that data. And that's why CSS is important. All right. Now let's talk a little bit about the basics. Now the nice part about CSS in general is it is a relatively easy language to understand, I would say. Um, that you're going to notice that it's really broken down into two basic sections. That we've got selectors, and then we're going to have the key value pairs. So our selectors are basically, what do we want to apply this to? And so this could be an individual element. This could be groups of elements. This could be elements uh, of a particular type. This could be elements in different locations. But it's, what do we want to apply this to? Then it's going to be, what property do we want to set and to what value do we want to set it to? So now that we've figured out, oh, OK, this is what we want to focus our attention on. This is what we want to manipulate. The next question then becomes, well, what do we want to, excuse me, what do we want to manipulate on that? Exactly how do we want to make that look? Do we want to move it somewhere else? Do we want to make it bold? Do we want to change the color? Things like that. So that's the basics of our CSS syntax. And the thing that you're going to notice is that this syntax is going to be true pretty much universally. So regardless of where it is that you happen to be applying this CSS, so if you put it into a section on a page, which we're going to take a look at, if you put it into an external file, it's still always going to be the exact same. The only place where you're not going to have a selector, which we'll see in a, in a couple of minutes, is if we, on an element, happen to say style equals. So we're not going to have a selector there, because it's going to be on that particular element. Instead, what we're going to do is we're just going to take our property value pairs and put those into there. OK. So now, let's talk about finding those elements. Now, I mentioned earlier that we're going to spend a lot of time on element selection. We've got an entire module coming up on element selection. For right now, we're just going to take a look at the basics. And those three basics are finding all items of a particular type, of a class, we'll have to talk about what a class is, and then finally, based on an ID. But let's start off by talking about an element. So an element, sort of as you might guess, is going to apply to the element. 
And so all we have to do inside of our CSS is simply say whatever the name of that element happens to be. And one very cool thing that you can do in the syntax, and I don't have it on the slide, is you can also actually list multiple elements with commas. So I could say, well, if I want that to apply to all h1 and all h2 tags, then I can just simply h1, comma, h2, comma, h3, and whatever else it is that, uh, that you might want. So all of our h2 elements in this case would then have three different properties set on them. So our font family, our font weight, and our color. Now, I mentioned earlier, we're not going to go through every single property. Because not only would that take forever, I think that would be a little bit boring. Yeah, I think a lot of these are <laughs> self-explanatory just from looking at it. Yeah, they, generally speaking, they are self-explanatory. Now, you know, one of the things, though, and, and I find this sometimes with, like, font weight and then font decoration, is it's not always as clear as you might hope. Yeah. This is where the IntelliSense in Visual Studio really shined, yeah. that the IntelliSense for CSS is spectacular. So that way, if you're not sure of what you're looking for, just start typing a few characters. Chances are, just like Helen said, because a lot of them are self-explanatory, you'll find the one that you're looking for. So just type a few characters and then go, oh, okay, that's the one that I want, and then let the IntelliSense sort of guide you from there. Exactly. I think the one that is confusing, though, is color. Um, color is one of the ones that we have here for the H2 element. Mm -hmm. And color, you might think color should just apply to whatever the element is. You know, if it's a, if it's like a, a box, that, that would apply to the box, but it, I mean, it usually just applies to text. Exactly. Yep. And that's that's the one that I think gets a lot of people in the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, it, you would think it might be font dash color. Yeah. Exactly. But it's color. If you if you put the the color thing, uh, um, the color property on body, it'll just apply to all the text in the body. Right. It won't make the it, you know change the background color, for instance. Exactly. But there is a background color property. Exactly. Which yeah. Uh, we'll get to. Yep, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, I also want to highlight real quickly here um, on this and kind of use this as, as a little side teaching is you'll notice that we've got font family. And one of the cool things that you can do with CSS, and this is a little bit advanced, and we're not going to uh, dig too far into it, is you can actually push down um, your own fonts. So if you have a troop type font and you want to push that down, you actually have, have that ability. Um, so fonts are obviously a very big thing. The, there are a couple little catches about trying to push down your own fonts and, and things like that. So whenever you are going to be choosing a font, you want to give the browser the ability to fall back to something else. So if it doesn't have a particular font that you might want, give it something that it can fall back to. And that's exactly what font family is going to do here, is that with font family, what I'm going to do is specify, OK, well, we want to use Verdana. If you don't have Verdana, then let's fall back to some other sans serif font, which is, is basically going to be just like that. So it's not going to have, um, uh, so for example, if I had an L. So that would be a serif, so it's got my little feet. Um, sans serif is just going to have the little L. Yeah. Sort of the simplest way, I think, to describe it. Yeah, I think serif fonts you can associate with like newspapers or basically print things. And there then sans serif is you know what you normally see sans serif fonts online. They're a bit easier to read on exactly. screens. Yeah, yeah, they're a little bit easier to digitalize. Yep, OK. so. Element, that's going to apply to every single H2. Now, when it comes to like an H2 tag, that's probably just fine. You know, because you're probably going to be using those for headers, and you probably want all of your headers to look the same. So H2, just globally say, yes, we want that to, to work for everything. That's going to be perfect. But how about a div tag? Do you think that you're going to globally be wanting to set things for all div tags or all span tags everywhere? Yeah, it's a bit too general, yeah, exactly. right? You're going to use those everywhere on your page. Exactly. So we want to be able to, rather than just simply saying, I want all div tags to look a particular way, we want to be able to identify particular types of div tags. Because it's going to be based on how we're currently using them. So we might be setting up a navigation section with a div tag. So I might say div, but I want this for my navigation. Or we might be setting up a sidebar, and I'm going to be using a div tag for, for that. So we want to be able to identify different types of div tag. And that's where class comes into play. That a class is going to give us the ability to identify elements of a particular type. And the way that we're going to identify that type is by adding on a class. So there's going to be two moving parts here. The first moving part is going to be inside of CSS. Now, you're going to notice here on the syntax that our syntax is slightly different from what we had before. That previously, we just simply said name of the tag. 
Now what you're going to notice is I've got a little dot there. And my dot indicates that this is going to be a class. So that needs to be inside the CSS. By the way, you are going to notice that a lot of the demos uh, are going to just simply use color, um, especially early on, just because it's such an easy way to identify when you're trying to do element selectors that, hey, look, this applied, or in the case of inheritance, that this is the one that actually won out. So we'll do a lot with, uh, with color with uh, uh, some of the early demos. But in any event, so we'll make that red. So that's the first part inside of CSS. The second part is going to be inside of the HTML. And you'll notice right there that we've got class equals title. Now, the great advantage to a class here is that classes are reusable. So it's possible that maybe this title is going to be for different sidebars. So I've got a sidebar here. I've got a sidebar over here. I want a title up top. I want a title up top. So I can go in and reuse that in multiple places. And I can flag, hey, this is going to be a title. Let me go erase all of my ink. There we go. Perfect. So we've got our CSS. We've got our HTML. And thus, the result is going to be hello CSS. Now, the problem with doing something like this is that that might be even still a little bit too vague that maybe I'm going to be using title in a couple of other places. Well, fortunately, I can say I only want a class to work on a particular tag type. And the way that we do that is just by putting in that little tag name right at the very beginning. So now you're going to notice that I've got div.title. So that's only going to apply to div tags. So inside my HTML example, you'll notice that I've got a span tag here, and I've got a div tag here. So the result, when this is all printed out, is you'll notice that that will apply to my div, but it's not going to apply to my span. So my span is going to be whatever the default color is, but my div tag will actually have our hello div. And that is one of the little annoying parts sometimes about CSS, is if something isn't working the way that you expect it to work, generally speaking, it just doesn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> or sometimes you know, it'll, it'll move something somewhere else. Um, but uh, it, it doesn't give you an error message. Um, and this sort of goes back to you know, old, old, old days, that one of the things the browser is going to try and do is look at what you've given it and try to make a best effort and not give you an error message if it isn't able to figure out exactly what you want. So it's just going to try and, and give you the best that, that it possibly can. Um, we will notice a little bit later when we get into like the, uh, the F12 tools that the F12 tools are really helpful in trying to track down exactly what's applying where and maybe try to uh, uh, troubleshoot exactly why a particular style isn't applying or not applying. Okay. Now, the problem with class is the fact that, again, it can be still a little bit too vague. So maybe on, on a page, there's one little spot that I need to go in and highlight, but only just that one spot. That's it. This is where ID comes into play. ID is only going to work on one specific element. And it's going to be that element with the ID attribute set on it. And that has to be unique. Has to be unique. One little side note here. And I, I think this is worth mentioning for anybody who's maybe going to be doing manual forms and things like that, is uh, I get a lot of questions about what's the difference between name and ID. And it's, it's, it's a good question. ID is what we can use with JavaScript and with CSS. Name is what's going to be sent back up to the server. Now, if it turns out that you didn't put in a name, then in that case, the ID would be sent up to the server. But if you do have a name, that's what's going to be sent up to the server. So let's say, for example, that again, you know, we've got a uh, we've got a form. So I've got my my little text box, and on the server, I've got some variable name that I'm going to be expecting. So maybe I'm just expecting that to be, uh, let's say, username. Um, use user. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, let's try that again. There we go. Um, 
U S E R N A M E. I can spell username. See? Yeah. Way to go, good me. Good job. All right. Yay. <laughs> okay. Now, here's the thing: is that's on the server side, and I may not have the ability to go in and change that on the server. So that always has to be username. But I may need to or have uh, a desire to change that on the client side. So that way, when I go into my JavaScript and I want to be able to manipulate that and kind of play around with that, I may want to be able to change that and not impact anything on the server. And this is quite common in bigger shops where you've got a web designer and you've got the programmer that's handling the, the behind the scenes part. So my web designer can sort of do whatever it is that they want, but they're not going to impact the programmer. So they can change the ID and that's what's going to impact the client. And as long as they keep the name the same, that's still all going to be good. So I always just kind of like to highlight that. Sort of a little bit of a tangent there, but uh, I always like to highlight that because that ID name question always comes up. Yeah. So, okay. In any event, um, the last little thing to mention here is just the syntax. You'll notice pound for an ID. So dot for a class, pound for an ID. Or hash, I guess, for, <laughs> for an ID. Um, and I will be the first to admit, I, I get those backwards quite a bit. I don't know if you do that a lot. You mean getting the pound sign and, oh, the pound sign and the, the dot? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll say, oh yeah, I want a class and I'll put a hashtag in front of that. <laughs> yeah, I, that's usually the first thing I check for when something's not working. I'm just like, <laughs> I, I must have selected it wrong. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Now, we've talked an awful lot. I think it's about time to start rolling into a demo. There's one last little thing that we got to talk about though, and then we can do a demo. I promise. We'll get to a demo. All right. But first, let's talk a little bit about how we're going to apply all of this style. And as it turns out, there's three different ways that you can apply a style sheet to or style to a page or to an element. The first way, and this generally speaking is the preferred way, is to link to it. So you'll notice that it's a link, relevance equals style sheet. Type equals text wax CSS, and then wherever that reference happens to be. Now, the nice part about doing that is once again that nice, clean separation of concern. So that way, my style's over here, my HTML is over here, my JavaScript is over there. So that nice, clean separation of concern. So that way, when I'm focusing on the HTML, I can focus in on the HTML. And then when I'm focusing on the style, I can focus in on the style. On top of that, this is also going to give you reuse. So that way I can use that on multiple pages. All right. Well, what happens if maybe there is a style, but I only want it on one page? And maybe, or I should do an or there, or maybe you're just looking to go in and play around uh, uh, a little bit. That maybe I don't want to create a, a full separate CSS file, that maybe I'm just doing a little proof of concept, I'm just doing a little bit of whiteboarding, and I just want to be able to test something and just kind of see how something is going to work real quickly. Well, you'll notice that you can actually just toss style into the head section on a page. And it's going to be that standard CSS syntax that we saw before, where I've got my selector, curly brace, curly brace, and then the individual values inside of there. So just put that right there into the page. And then finally, last but not least, you can also, if you want, put style directly onto an element. And that's just simply going to have those property value pairs right inside of there. Now, I know some of you are probably already wondering, well, what happens if it turns out that we have something in a style sheet that's external, something inside of a page, and then something on an individual file? You're probably wondering that, and I'm with you. We're going to get to that. See? See? There's your little teaser. <laughs> I promise we're going to get to that. But first, let's actually get in and start doing a little bit of a demo. I think it's time, don't you? Yeah. Start <laughs> to actually see the CSS in action. Yeah, exactly. All right. Let's see. 
And I'm going to apologize, and this is going to be my my one um, apology. Um, you are going to notice I'm, I'm sort of down a paw here. Um, I, uh, I I really should come up with like a, a fantastic story involving ninjas or something. Um, but uh, I actually just lost a battle with a wine glass, which is really what happened there. So if you notice my typing is a little slow, there's there's my apology. I mean, the tragic gumbo loss, I think, is a good story. Yeah, that is a good story. I had this fantastic pot of gumbo cleaning a wine glass over here. Wine glass shatters, and of course. The, the glass also wound up in a gumbo, so the gumbo was lost. That, that was tragic. That was tragic. We'll be holding a memorial service later this week for the gumbo. So please send relay powder. Okay. Um, in any event, my house was smelling fantastic as well. All right. Let's go in and let's uh, set up a, uh, a basic uh, web page here. Now, you're going to notice that in all of our demos, we're going to be doing basic HTML here. So we're not going to be doing um, MVC. We're not going to be doing Flask. We're not going to be doing PHP. We really are focused in on just the CSS. But one big thing to highlight is, of course, you can use CSS with MVC, with Flask, with PHP, with Node. Um, so it, it's going to apply everywhere. But one of the big things that we wanted to try and do is keep it as simple as possible. And so really just HTML. Yeah. So I don't think any of your demos have MVC in them. Do no, they? they don't even have JavaScript in them because I okay. just want you to know that you know, all <laughs> the styling, CSS. Exactly. <laughs> just CSS. All CSS all the time. OK. Um, so in any event, let me go in web and let's go in in CSS demos. And I'm just going to highlight mine just to separate them from yours. Christopher demos. There we go. Perfect. And let's hit OK. And by the way, um, we are going to be throwing all of these up onto uh, GitHub. And uh, we'll uh, go ahead and share out the, the little GitHub link uh, a little bit later. But all of these will be available for, uh, for you to use. Creating projects. Perfect. OK. So let me just go in and say, um, add new item and HTML. And let's go ahead and call this my uh, index page. And let's get uh, rocking and rolling here. All right, now for right now, I'm just going to put the style right inside of here. And the reason that I'm going to do that is just for simplicity's sake, because I'm going to be kind of bouncing back and forth between the style and the HTML. So just to avoid going back and forth from file to file to file, I'm just going to do it inside of here. And then in a couple of minutes, we'll go off and, and, and move that somewhere else. So let's just go in and say uh, style, which is spelled like that. Cool. So now let's go in and create a little div tag. And of course, since this is a, a development class, we're required. Hello, world. Hello, word. Ah, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it's also a real thing, hello, word, yeah. if you're creating your first Word document. There you go, yeah, hello, word. Yeah, that would work. <laughs> All right. And now, Control F5. And I'm just going to use the snap feature here. Maybe. Where's my browser? Come here. There we go. OK. And let me also kind of zoom in on that real quick. All right. So I'm just going to use the snap feature here. And uh, Windows 7 was, uh, was my idea. There we go. So there's our page over here on that side. And there's our HTML. So like we mentioned, the way that style works, if you want an element, all you have to do is to simply say the name of the element, curlies. And then right inside of here, key value pair. So let's just go in and change the, uh, the font. So I'm going to say font family. And um, I'm going to use Comic Sans MS here. I, I would never recommend that you ever actually use Comic Sans MS. But the reason that I'm using it is really just because of the fact that you'll notice it, it, it's a very visible change. So yeah. sort of like changing the color, you know, that's very visible. The moment you change something to Comic Sans MS, that's pretty obvious. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, it's also worth noting that Christopher put the style in the, the head part of uh, the HTML document. Yeah. And if you are doing in-page CSS, that is where you should put it. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. OK. So. There it is. That's all there is. Just simply name of the element, and away you go from there. But if I wanted to go in and specify a particular, again, type, then what I could do is I could say title, and then, again, curly. And then maybe we go in and we say um, color, colon, and let's go in and change something to blue. Now, if I save this and I hit refresh, you're going to notice no changes. Because, of course, 
I don't actually have an element with a class on it. So let's go in and say div, and let's say class equals, I love that bit of IntelliSense. You'll <laughs> notice that it actually, right there, yeah, title, there we go. And uh, I can now go and say uh, title. I'll just kind of keep it nice and easy, and I'll hit save, and I'm going to hit refresh. Now, when I hit refresh here, you're going to notice, of course, that title appears, that we were expecting, and you'll also notice that it's blue. And that we were also kind of expecting, because, of course, you'll notice that I had class, and I had my little class down here. But one of the other things that you might notice about that text, what font is it using? Comic Sans. It's using Comic Sans. Why is that? Well, what is cascading, or I, I sort of gave away the answer there. What does CSS stand for? Cascading style sheets. There you go, yeah. cascading style sheets. So your styles will cascade. So we said that we want our div tags, all div tags, globally, to use Comic Sans MS. I said that I wanted something with that class to be blue. So what's happening is that it's applying all of those styles together. All right, now give me one second here. Um, I just need to fire up my file explorer here just because I want zoom it and zoom it. Zoom it, because it's a great little presentation tool. And I'm gonna bring up the F12 tools here. Because I love being able to go in and actually select the items, and we can see this in action here. So let me just kind of uh, zoom that around, and I'm going to click on the little um, element selection button right there, and then let me click on title. And once I click on title, if I come over here, what you're going to notice inside of our style section is we've got our div tag here, and we've got our title class here. So it's actually showing me every single style that it read to make that happen. So why is it Comic Sans MS? Well, it's Comic Sans MS because we told div tags to be Comic Sans MS. And why is it blue? Well, because of the fact that we said that class title was going to be blue. So that's how all of that's going to come together. Now, you might be wondering at this point, all right, well, now we've seen that if you say, well, I want the font to be this and the color to be this, then it will combine everything. What happens if something said do red, for example, and something else said do blue? Ooh, conflicts. Conflicts. All right. Well, fortunately, we've got a full section on conflicts. I, I teased the slide. Let's actually do it now. Let's talk about CSS, inheritance, and conflicts. And I think the easiest way to describe this is really in two very simple steps. Last right wins, and whatever closest describes the item wins. Yeah. OK. Now, we're going to break all of that down. But if you keep those two things in your head, you'll be just fine in, I think, every case. All right. So cascading, like we said, it's right there in the name. Conflicts are expected. But conflicts only arise. If something says do one thing and something else on that exact same property said do something else. So if it happened to be one thing said do red, another thing did do blue, that's a conflict. In our case, that wasn't a conflict because we said we wanted the font to be something and we said we wanted the color to be something. No conflict there. So those are simply combined. So the question then becomes, all right, well, what about inside of a conflict? Well, step one, last right wins. And everything is going to be applied in order. So the first thing that's actually going to be applied, and it's reverse on my slide because I was trying to show whatever the most powerful was. Yeah. It's reverse on my slide here. It's going to apply first. We'll do it that way. There we go. The external style sheet. Then it's going to apply the style section. And then it's going to apply the style attribute. Or if, if you like to be kind of a more positive person, then the style attribute takes precedence, and then it's the style section, and then it's the external style sheet. So let's do this. Let's actually get in and do a demo here and kind of see that in action. Perfect. All right. So let me maximize that, and let me sneak on into here, and I'm going to say add, and I want a style sheet. And actually, you know, I'm going to be kind of a good developer here. I'm going to create a brand new folder, and I'm going to say styles. 
and I'm going to add it into there. Uh, style sheet, perfect. And let's just call this uh, index, kind of match the name of the page. There we go. All right. And now what I'm going to do inside of here is I'm going to say pound title. So if you remember, we had a class already called title. And see, I told you I was going to do it at some point. Dot title. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> told you I was going to do it. And let's go ahead and say color colon and let's say red. So just to kind of review here, you're going to notice blue here, red there. So let's kind of see what happens. Let me make sure that I link this. And I love this about Visual Studio. Just simply drag drop. And it's linked. Wow. Yep, just like that. So it's already got everything. It doesn't put in the type equals, and that's fine. You really don't actually need that. Yeah, it's CSS default. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So let's go ahead and save that. Let's bring back up my browser. And what you're going to notice is that, sure enough, my title is still blue. Why is it blue? The reason that it's blue is because that was set on the external file. We said on the actual HTML file that we want that to be blue here, so blue is going to win. And you'll also notice that if I go back in and I select that in the F12 tools, I love this about the F12 tools, that we can actually see that, there we go, in action down below. So you'll notice uh, down below there's our little div, okay, that we were expecting, and right here are the two classes. And I can see where those were applying from. And you'll also notice it does give me little score things as well. And if we want to get really, really technical, there are score things that apply with CSS. But I, I always think it's just simpler. Last right wins and whatever best describes the element. Just stick to that, and, and that's going to make your life a whole lot easier. Yeah. But you'll notice right here that's crossed out. So we can see the browser saw it. The browser saw that external file. The browser saw, hey, we want the color to be red. But it said, wait a minute, no, 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 no. Something else wins, and it's going to have that blue win. So you'll notice that the red is all crossed out. Blue wins. Yeah. And what's nice about the F12 tools is if you um, deselect you know, the, the title color attribute, you yeah. can see what would happen. Yep, exactly. So just like Helen mentioned, let's actually just do that. So let's take away that little title right there. And now you'll notice that it changes to red. So it's a nice way that you can go in and play around with things to, um, uh, to kind of um, uh, see that in action, kind of test to see how things would, uh, would work. Um, and you'll actually notice there are tools. I want to say the name of the tool is Sidewaffle. I think that's the name of the tool. Sidewa I haven't heard of Sidewaffle. Sidewaffle. Um, so it's it's a little add-on that you can go get. John Galloway loves Sidewaffle. Um, it's a little add-on that you can go get, and it does an awful lot of um, uh, like little add-on tools with CSS and things like that. And I want to say that one of the features for Sidewaffle is that it will um, give you the ability to go in and play around with this and have it automatically update inside uh, Visual Studio. So kind of a slick little tool there. I want to say it's Sidewaffle. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check at, uh, at, at, at break. OK. All right. In the meantime, let's go back in and, and kind of keep playing around here. So you'll notice again that, that, that external, that internal. Let me also do um, uh, do this real quick. Um, I'm going to just say manage NuGet packages, and just because I, I I'm willing to bet that somebody listening is playing around with Bootstrap, and one of the things about Bootstrap is that Bootstrap can be very overwhelming, and because there's you know a billion different classes that are inside of there, I, I don't think I'm exaggerating by that much. Uh, but there's like a billion different classes and so forth. And so a lot of people will see Bootstrap and they'll just start to go, oh my gosh, I, I, I don't know what to, to do with all of this. Um, and they, they get very overwhelmed when they want to go in and play around with the style that Bootstrap is going to, uh, to provide. Well, here's the thing, is the styling that Bootstrap is using is doing CSS. So all of the same rules apply. So let's say that right here, I dragged out the uh, bootstrap min CSS. There we go. And down below, I said div um, class equals, uh, and let's say uh, jumbotron, and let's say div and hello uh, bootstrap. There we go. And let's go in and say bootstrap. OK. And so you'll notice that we get that little gray background. We get the, uh, the font and all of that. All of that is coming in from bootstrap and the Jumbotron class. We can overwrite that. 
So if I want the text inside of Jumbotron to be blue, for example, fine. Then all I would have to do is to simply say style and then dot Jumbotron. And then right inside of here, I can just say color colon blue. Let's save that. Let's come back over here, hit refresh, and you'll notice that it's blue. And again, if you want that in an external file, let's just cut that real quick. And let's, I'm just going to put it into my style section. I'm kind of keeping it separate from, uh, from the other one, style sheet. And I'm going to say bootstrap demo. There we go. And let's just paste that inside of there. There we go. Save. And let's just do a drag and drop here. And you'll notice I just need to make sure that it's after. Last right wins. So I'm just putting it after the original bootstrap. There's my custom one. Let's go in, hit save. Let's come back over here, hit refresh. And you'll notice it's still blue. So when it comes to bootstrap, and, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that we've got an awesome Bootstrap MVA. But when it comes to Bootstrap, Bootstrap can be over, very overwhelming because of all the different classes. But at the end of the day, what is it? CSS. And all the same rules still apply. Yeah. Yep. Um, I think we should also mention that there's another way to overwrite CSS properties, mm -hmm. override CSS properties, and it's not recommended. OK. Do you know what I'm talking about? Go for it. It's the, uh, it's the important. Property. Okay. So, um, so for instance, if you know you have two two properties that are in conflict, mm -hmm. um, and one is maybe high, or one is not exactly the last right. If you put in uh, exclamation mark important after the property, it, it will become more important and overwrite that style. This is this is not a good practice. <laughs> you should not use this. But it is one of the one of the ways that you see a lot of people overriding styles. I, I, I would see that getting very messy very yeah. quickly. Uh, use it sparingly, preferably not at all. <laughs> but it is it is there. Okay. It's worth mentioning. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Now let's um, uh, kick on back to uh, to slides here. We've got just one last little um, conflict here that's uh, that's worth highlighting, and that's in the case of an element. So what happens if maybe we had something that was set for uh, a div tag and for a class, and you know one was supposed to be red, one was supposed to be blue? What do we do in that case? And the best way to describe this is whatever best describes the element. So if I just say globally, I want all div tags to be something, that's going to apply first. And then if I say I want classes to be, or a particular class to be something, that's going to apply second. And then the ID is going to apply third. Again, last right wins. Or if we want to be kind of the more positive way, what's going to be more important? ID is more important, and then class, and then element. Or if we break this down and actually just you know look at it, just do a demo. I like demos. Let's go in and just do a demo. So let me do this. I'm going to just sneak right down here. And I'm just going to say div. And I'm going to say class equals title. And I'm going to say id equals uh, green. And this is our conflict. Here, well, we'll make it you know, conflict with, with exclamation points. <laughs> ah. All right. So let's, um, for right now, just go in and say color colon um, red. And let me go like this. OK, I'm going to put you on the spot. Are you ready for this? Uh, maybe. Maybe. OK. So our little conflict text here. Mm -hmm. So you'll notice that right now I've got a div on it. And I've got my class equals title. So you'll notice on div I've got red. You'll notice my class title I've got blue. What color do you think conflict is going to be in? Um, it would, I mean, it would be whatever is closest. So I don't, I would say blue. There you go. And it's going to be blue. So sure enough, our conflict is blue. Now, let's go in and add on our ID as well. I love IntelliSense. There we go. And let's go in and say color colon green. And then we'll come back over here. And now if I hit refresh, what you're going to notice is that it's green. So for the element, then for the class, then for the ID, ID is going to win. So whatever best describes the element. Now, the easiest way to handle conflicts, I think, in general, 
is try to avoid them whenever possible, just because it can get very messy very quickly um, if, uh, if you're not careful. And again, if you're ever not sure, the F12 tools do such a great job of showing you exactly what's going on there. And again, you'll notice kind of the, the scores at the end there. So um, that had the highest score, which is why that won. But again, I always think it's simpler. Just element class ID. Just sort of keep that and, and the rest is, is pretty straightforward from there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, I see a lot of people are asking about, you know, is Bootstrap the alternative to CSS? What is the difference between Bootstrap and CSS? That's a great question. All right, so in a nutshell, um, Bootstrap is a template. Bootstrap is an out-of-the-box set of JavaScript files and CSS that's going to be designed to help make it easier to lay out a site because it does a lot of things automatically for you. So for example, let's come back over here to uh, my little uh, Visual Studio, my, my very simple little index HTML. And you'll notice that with my index HTML, I've got nothing here. That, that uh, There's no automatic banner, there's no automatic button style, there's nothing. Now, I can add all of that if I want to, but I get nothing here. What Bootstrap does, and let me actually just create a brand new MVC project, um, just because it's got that Bootstrap automatically there, and I think it's going to be um, kind of an easy way to, uh, to highlight Bootstrap. So I'm just going to do that real quick. Chugger, 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 chugger. And moving your mouse makes it go faster. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay. And let me just make sure that that set is my startup. Do, 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 do. Set as startup. There we go. Okay. And let me launch this. So, what you're going to notice is MVC by default uses Bootstrap. And what Bootstrap is going to do is it's going to give me a lot of different components and a lot of built-in classes that I can use. So once this comes up here, you'll notice this huge block right here in the middle, that's the Jumbotron class. And so that's what's making that gray, that's what's making that a, uh, a bigger font. You'll notice that the button here has little rounded corners on it, it's got that blue background, and again, that's because of yet another class inside of Bootstrap. And you'll actually notice, if I do this, content and Bootstrap CSS, here is all of the different classes that have been defined inside of Bootstrap and all of the different defaults that it's going to set on all of the different elements inside of there. So Bootstrap isn't a replacement for CSS. Bootstrap uses CSS. Bootstrap is an out-of-the-box set of CSS classes and defaults and otherwise that you can use. And what's also nice about Bootstrap is the fact that it is, um, it's, it's an open standard, I think is the best way to, to put it. It was put out there by Twitter. Um, and so there's a great community around Bootstrap. And you can find all sorts of different Bootstrap themes out there. So you can just drag and drop that on onto your project and poof, it will automatically look like that theme. Now, at that point, the natural question might become, well, wait a minute, if Bootstrap is gonna do all of this for me, why am I going to stop and learn CSS? Well, because if you want to tweak something, you're still going to need to know CSS. So using Bootstrap doesn't take away the need to know CSS. It makes a lot of things easier, but you are still going to need to know CSS. So that way, if you want to go in and tweak one little thing, that you know how to do that. I think that's sort of the, the best way that I could describe yeah. Bootstrap versus CSS. Exactly. I mean, Bootstrap at the end of the day, all the styling is done by CSS, mm -hmm. or I should say most of the styling is done by CSS. Yep. But I mean, it'll do the heavy lifting for you, but any tweaks you want to make, you'll still have to do that using CSS. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Cool. Well, with that, what do you say we, uh, we take a break? Yeah. All right. We'll see <laughs> you back here soon in yeah. a couple minutes. In about 10 minutes. So we'll see you guys then.
Alright, well, uh, welcome back. This is uh, Still Adding Style with uh, CSS. That's still Helen and I'm still Christopher. Yeah. And, uh, yay! And we, uh, we left off the, uh, the last module um, really kind of focused in on finding element and how uh, conflicts work. And when we took a look at applying those uh, particular uh, items, we, we really kind of, of saw at a very basic level. So we did like classes and IDs and so forth. But, you know, as we all know, our pages are going to be much more complex than that. So I may need to change something based on where it is on the page or based on the hierarchy or maybe even based on what the user is currently doing. So if they put their mouse over something, it might be nice to go ahead and highlight that particular spot. And you'll notice that CSS is going to give us a lot of great power in going in and finding the particular sections and items and elements and otherwise that we want on the page. Now, as a real quick side note, a lot of people have asked in the Q&A about CSS3. And one of the things that we didn't mention earlier that's definitely worth mentioning now is, well, CSS, like everything else, is changing over time. And different browsers are implementing different components and, and, and pieces sort of on their own schedule. And sometimes they're going to go off and do kind of their own thing. Now, fortunately, as we're going to see a little bit later on today, sometimes they'll actually throw in their own vendor-specific prefix in front of different proposed CSS options, tags, properties, or, or otherwise. But the long and short of it is, unfortunately, you are going to find that certain things are not always going to work in all browsers. So you will have to go in and test. You will have to kind of make sure that everything still looks good, even if it doesn't necessarily look perfect from browser to browser to browser. And this is probably going to be the first, well, not probably, this will be the first section that we're going to see sometimes behavior like that. So it might work in IE, might not work in Chrome, might not work in, in Safari. Yeah. So I mean, CSS3, it. It is CSS. It's a list. It's basically a list of standards mm -hmm. that um, the W3C yep. um, organization has proposed. They're saying you know CSS should contain these things. It should <laughs> do these things. But it's up to different browsers to actually implement them, right? Yep. So when we say CSS3, we typically mean oh these are the standards that we expect CSS to behave in. This is what cur like modern day CSS should look like. Yep. So it is CSS, but th there are new features exactly. um, that may or may not be implemented. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's sort of the perfect way, I, I think, to, uh, to put it. That's perfect. All right. In any event, let's go ahead and start digging in and taking a look at, uh, at our different uh, selectors here. So we're going to start off talking about the different ways that we can find items based on their structure. We'll then roll on into these things called pseudo classes and pseudo elements, which allow us to find items based on their type or, base, or rather based on what's happening, what they're doing. And then we'll close it all off with a little section on sizing, and in particular focused in on font size. Sizing, uh, rather than maybe sizing boxes and things like that, uh, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. But first, let's start talking about our document structure. And I'm actually going to um, sort of sidestep for a little bit. I'm, I'm going to go slightly um, um, uh, off center here. And, and what I want to do is I want to take a look at my little sample page here that, uh, that I've created. And, and, and it's, it's very ugly uh, right now. And, and that's sort of by design, because what I want to do is, is gussy this up uh, a little bit over the next handful of demos and kind of make this look the, the way that we want it to, uh, to look. And by the way, if you're curious, um, there's a, a great little website, uh, Bacon Ipsum, that's uh, a lorem ipsum generator that uses you know, all sorts of different meat products. You've got all of that there. There's all sorts of other ones out there. There's like a, a, a hipster Ipsum. There's a, a vegetarian Ipsum. So there's all sorts of different Ipsum generators <laughs> that are out there. This is just the one that, uh, that I went with. Um, but in any event, um, very, very, you know, ugly. You'll notice that there is no formatting here, really, with the exception of my, uh, my little list up at the, uh, the top here. And I would also mention, uh, just kind of go in and, uh, and highlight the, uh, the HTML here, 
that what I did was I used HTML5. And for those of you not familiar with HTML5, HTML5, among other things, introduces a lot of semantic tags, where rather than saying this is how I want it to display, because that's the job of CSS, what we're going to do is describe the data that's contained inside of it. So that's our nav section, that's our navigation section. And there's an article, and then inside of my article, I've got two different sections inside of my article. And I really like the collapsible regions here. Kind of makes it a little bit easier to see. So we've got our nav section up top, we've got our article, we've got our, uh, our article. Okay, now I am going to, um, and again, I'm doing this for simplicity's sake. And I don't want you to look at this and think, oh, well, he's sort of doing a, a do as I say, not as I do type thing. So I'm not doing that. I'm just trying to make my demos go a little bit easier. So you are going to notice that I'm not going to create a separate style file here. Should I? 100%. And if I was doing this in production, I would 100% have a separate file for this. But because of the fact that I want the ability to show the HTML and the style very easily, I want the ability to bounce back and forth between the um, the, the style section and that HTML and, and be able to make those quick little changes. It's going to be easier for demos if I just put the style here. So don't hate me because I'm putting the style inside the HTML page. I know this is not best practice. This is just going to make the demos easier. Okay. Um, by the way, one little side note. People have asked about this little sidebar over here. This is one of the cool uh, little features um, inside uh, scroll. There we go. Uh, yeah, so you'll notice under uh, scroll bars here, uh, just type up top uh, scroll bars. Let me just click on that. That uh, over there, uh, you have the ability to set up the bar mode, which is the classic, or you've got map mode, and that gives you that little bar right there. So that way I can go in and mouse over and actually see what's inside of there. And that's a cool little feature inside of uh, 2013. Okay. In any event, let's um, uh, go back to my little page. And what you're going to notice is right up at the very top, I've got a uh, my navigation section. So of course, I've got a bunch of um, anchor tags inside of there. And I want to style those. So maybe I want to make them bold. And maybe I want to take away the um, underline that's, uh, that's on them. So maybe those are the, the two things that, uh, that I want to be able to do to that. Well, that's perfect for navigation because if I'm looking at a page and I see the navigation section, what am I expecting inside of a navigation section? I'm expecting links. Makes sense, right? Yeah. Okay. So I don't need that visual clue of an underline. But if I'm looking at an article, I'm going to need something that's going to be some form of a visual clue. And maybe that's uh, an underline, maybe that's a different font color, or something like that. So long and short is the links that I'm going to have in an article, I probably want to look a little bit different than the ones that I have over here. All right, well, how can I tackle that? Well, one way that I could potentially tackle that, since we know we're not going to be able to just simply say A and apply that to all anchor tags because that's going to apply globally, so we can't do that. One way that I could do this is I could create one class here for my nav section and then another class over here. But you know, that's going to become a little bit of a pain because I'm going to have to remember to always put that class in again and again, and again, and again. And when you start talking about things like Bootstrap, I'm going to bring up Bootstrap again, which is very class driven, you're going to find that you've got a little bit of HTML and a ton of class mentions. So if we can do something without having to always add in a class, that's going to make our lives easier. So that way we don't have to remember to always put it into there. We've got a lot less clutter on our page. And we're able to say, based on the document structure, this is how we want something to look. On top of that, if I later move something from one spot to another somewhere on my page, because of the fact that we're using those pseudo elements, those pseudo classes, or the document structure selectors, it's automatically going to pick up that style based on where I put it. So really a, a better way to do things. So let's start off by taking a look at how we can identify things based on document structure. So let's take a look at a little bit of, of, of CSS here. And let's talk about our parent child and our containers. 
Now, inside of CSS, on the selector, if I say class and class, so nav A, for example, what I'm saying is I'm looking for an anchor tag anywhere inside of that nav element. So I've got a nav element, inside of there there's an anchor, and it's only going to apply to an anchor that's inside of a nav bar. If, however, I add in that little angle bracket, and it's subtle, but it makes a huge difference, then the anchor tag must be a direct child of, in this case, nav. I think the best way to do it is to see it. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's get in and actually dig into it. Okay. So let me open up my little nav section here, and here's my little style, and I'm going to start off by doing this the incorrect way. Um, and I, always, I, I sort of like starting with the incorrect way, and that way we can see, wait a minute, nothing happened, and then we go back and, and make it work. So remember that with that little angle bracket, what that's going to mean is it has to be a direct child. And if we take a look at our structure here, what we're going to notice, there's all of our anchor tags. Those are obviously not direct children of nav, because they're all inside of li, all inside of UL, list item, unordered list, and then nav. So this is not going to work. So if I go in and I say text um, decoration uh, none, and I say font uh, weight, and let's say bold, what you're going to notice is if I, uh, do I have, I do have my browser, there it is. Perfect. Let's go ahead and hit refresh, and you're going to notice no change because that angle. So if I take that away, and now I save and I come back over here and I hit refresh, now you're gonna notice everything is bold, and you're also gonna notice that all of my underlines are gone. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do this real quick as well. Um, I'm just gonna globally apply this um, font family, and let's, uh, let's use a Verdana. I think that's just gonna make things a little bit easier. There we go. I think that looks a little bit better. Yeah, I'm not a fan of serif fonts on screen, <laughs> just ever. <laughs> okay, perfect. All right. <laughs> so this makes you much happier then. Yes. Okay. But I wasn't going to say anything. Otherwise. All right. I appreciate that. <laughs> <I'm> polite. <laughs> and I appreciate that. Okay. So what you're going to notice here is that now my underlines are gone and now it's bold, again because of that, uh, that space rather than, the, um, rather than the angle bracket. So let me just kind of put in the comment here. Space um, is going to be contained inside of element. And let me just uh, also put in a comment uh, right here is that the angle bracket um, indicates a direct uh, parent-child uh, uh, relationship. There we go. And again, um, we will be sharing all of this out on uh, on, on GitHub. Uh, I'll go in and, and check all of those, and we'll put the links into the chat yeah. window, because I know everybody's probably wondering where they can go get the, all of this. All right, cool. So there's very kind of simple, based on where it happens to be, we want to go in and highlight things. And that's good, and that's perfect for things like this. But you know, let's come back over to our little section over here. and. Maybe what we want to be able to do on, on the text is maybe we want to be able to highlight kind of the first letter, or maybe we want to be able to highlight the first paragraph and then use a different font down below and, and, and things like that. And fortunately, we can go in and clean all of, uh, all of that up. Um, I am going to do one real quick thing, only just because it's bothering me. Um, and um, Heather's going to talk about this uh, a little bit later, but I am just going to do um, padding bottom, and let me just do 20 pixels. Uh, there we go. That it was just it was really bugging me. I just yeah. I, I needed a little bit of space there. No, I I get it. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Back to our slides. Cool. So like I said. What we want to be able to do is we want to be able to identify, for example, the first letter, or the first paragraph, or the first block, or maybe based on something being highlighted. That is where pseudo classes and pseudo elements come into play. Now, the difference between a pseudo class and a pseudo element is very subtle syntax and both just sort of semantically, technically. That a pseudo class is going to apply to an entire element. And that's based on where that element is or based on the current state. 
So if somebody has put their mouse over it, if somebody has highlighted it, uh, actually highlighted isn't right, um, but if somebody's put their mouse over it, if it's at the top, if it's at the bottom, if it's the last item, if it's an odd item, if it's an even item, etc., all of that is where pseudo classes come into play. So rather than me explicitly having to say dot and then the name of a class and then inside of HTML saying class equals, it's going to be based on something about that element. So for example, it might be the first item in the hierarchy. So maybe we want to bump up the font size just a little bit on the first paragraph and then a slightly smaller font on, on everything else. Or maybe for the last item, that we know the last item that's going to be down at the very bottom, it's going to be inside of a div tag, but we know that that's where our copyright is going to be, so maybe we want to make that smaller. Then we can go in and do that. Or maybe we want to apply a style if it happens to be the only child. So maybe this is a search results page and what we want to display is sorry, no results found, and we want that to appear with a particular type of font. We can do all of that with pseudo classes. So pseudo classes are all based on something about that element, based on where it is or based on what's going on. So it could be based on position. So first child, last child, the nth child inside of its particular parent. By the way, the nth child, you will notice, will actually take a number, or you can also Use the text odd and even. Now, for anybody who's been programming HTML for a little while, you're probably all familiar with having to go in and try to set something up for that, you know, that, that different shading for odd or for even. There, problem solved. Odd, <laughs> even, done. So yeah. much easier. Okay, and then you'll also notice that we've got position and type. And this one, really I think is subtle. I don't want to use the word confusing, um, because it, but it definitely is subtle. And, and here's the way that this is going to work. Let me, um, there we go, do this. Let's say I said div colon uh, first um, of type, and then I set you know, whatever my style happened to be, and then let's um, up here say that I said div, and I said first um, child like this. There we go. All right. So what's the difference between me saying first child and me saying first of type? It's a great question. And the answer is that first of type is going to be based on where that div tag is on the entire page. So it's the absolute first div tag. Contrast that with first child first child is going to be based on its parent container. And let's do this. Let's go back into Visual Studio here. I think this is going to be sort of an easier way to, um, to drill into this. So let's open up my couple little sections here. And we'll leave it like this. Okay. So what I want you to notice is there is my little section in a div tag, and there is my little section in a div tag. Now in both of these cases here, these both are first child. The reason that they're both first child is because they're both the first child of that section element. So they're the first div tag inside of that section. So if I wanted to do something with the first paragraph in each section, I can now do that. But this one right here also happens to be the first of type. Why? Because it's the first div tag that appears anywhere on my page. So first child, based on the parent, first of type, first time that that thing appears anywhere. Now, for me, in my personal experience, I generally don't find myself using first of type all that often, but I do find myself using last of type periodically. And again, it's for that little 
section down at the very bottom. So that way, if you've got you know all of your little links about you know uh, now hiring and about us and the copyright and all of that, and that's contained inside of a div, and you know that that's always going to be at the end, that's perfect. That way, you can just simply say last of type, and I know that that's always going to uh, to be the case. In fact, here let's just go in and 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 we'll add that right in. Um, let me just add in a, a div right down here, and now hiring and whatever it is that we want to do. OK, so let's go in and style all of that. So here's what I want to do, is I want to bump up the font size just a little bit of the uh, initial paragraphs. And I want to make that bottom section, let's just say red, just to kind of make it very, very obvious there. OK, and let me also, um, I'm just going to say font um, size, and I'm going to say 16 pixels. And let me see, how's that, how's that going to look here? OK, that's perfect, actually. Excellent. All right. So now, let me go in and I want to grab first paragraph of each um, section. And if you remember, our paragraphs are currently set up as div tags. OK, so I'm going to say div, colon, and then you'll notice I've got first child. And then I can just say curly brace. And now I can say font size, and let's go ahead and make that 20 pixels, um, which is probably bigger than we would really want it, but I'm trying to make it really obvious here. So first child, and now let's come back over here. Let's hit refresh, and now you'll notice that's nice and big. And let's scroll down. There's our second paragraph, our third paragraph, our fourth paragraph, and our fifth paragraph in that section. And then you'll notice, once again, big. Now let me update the text. I think that's also going to make it a little bit more, more obvious here. So let's just go in and say, first in section, scroll on down, and first in section. And now let's come back over here, refresh. And then you'll notice that that one is nice and big. Scroll on down, small, 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 and then again, nice and big. You're looking at me like you have a question. Um, could you scroll up in the code? Why is it that, so what is the first child of div? OK, so that's a great question, because that's sort of the way that it reads, that it looks like it's saying, I'm looking for the first child of the div tag. But it's not. So what a pseudo class or pseudo element applies to is to the tag in question. So I'm not looking for a child of div. I'm looking for div, and I'm trying to see what it's a child of. So that's a great question, because when you look at it, and, and I did that too when I first looked at, at this, when I was first learning this, is that I looked at that and I said, wait a minute, is this, is this you know, looking for the first child inside of div? It's not. It's looking at the div tag and looking at the structure of the div tag. So it's not looking at the contents of the div tag. It's looking at the div tag itself and seeing, is it the first child of something? So great question. Great question. OK. Now, let's also go in and say div. And I'm going to say last of type. And then let's just go in and say color colon blue. And let's say font uh, size. And let's make that you know uh, 12 pixels. OK. And now let's again come back, hit refresh. And now what you're going to notice You weren't supposed to do that. Ha! <laughs> You're not supposed to do it that way. All right, in any event, it's actually putting it on the section, which it's not supposed to do. It's supposed to be on, on the page itself. Um, so this is just sort of making a liar out of me. Um, see, we're really cooking on this show. Live demos. Live <laughs> demos right here in front of you. We told you guys CSS is finicky. <laughs> and is. This is one of the cases. Exactly. All right. So in any event, so last of type is supposed to be the last of, of that item. Um, I'm just going to make that uh, go away for right now. That's really weird. I'll have to go back and, and, uh, and work with that later. We're really cooking here. All right. In any event, so um, what I want you to notice just to kind of review this, is that this allows me to, again, based on the document structure, do something different with it, which is cool. Now, I did one little thing inside of my Visual Studio here. Uh, and that is I hit Control-K, Control-D. Two-part shortcut, Control-K, Control-D, which formats the document. One of the things that you're going to notice about CSS is that this is going to get very big very quickly 
And so formatting becomes a very important component. And so you'll notice there's my div, and then there is a pseudo class for div. And so you'll notice that that is tabbed in. And that is a best practice. So whatever you want globally, and then all of the pseudos, you're going to want tabbed in. OK. Cool, cool, cool. Back to slides. There we go. Now, how about, rather than based on document structure, how about element state? Based on what's going on. So maybe we want something to look different if you've clicked on it. Then maybe we want to bold it like a checkbox. Um, or maybe if you hover over something, then we want to put the underline back onto it. Because if I go back to my page here, and let's just go all the way back up to the very top, we're going to notice there's our nav section. OK, that's all, you know, peachy keen, hunky dory. But, you know, it still would be really, really nice if we could make that more obvious that that's a link. So when you put your mouse over it, It'd be nice to see an underline, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. Well, sure enough, we can do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say nav a colon and then hover. Hover, of course, just like the JavaScript. You know, you hover over something. That's going to be when the mouse is over it. And then let's go ahead and say text uh, decoration and let's say underline. Cool. Save. Let's come back over here. Let's hit refresh. And now you're going to notice when I put my mouse over it that sure enough, we get those little underlines. So now I can clearly say, oh, look, OK, that is, in fact, a link. Cool. Now, let's come back over here real quick. And I want to highlight one other thing. So again, you're going to notice that the, the syntax colon in, in, in my pseudo class there. But you are going to notice that, that I can still go in and use everything else that I've used. So if you remember, that space, of course, means contained inside of an element. So this is now going to say that this is only going to apply to an anchor tag when somebody mouses over it, and that that anchor tag is inside of a nav section. So you can get as explicit as you want when going in and defining those elements and how you want everything to look inside of a page. Cool. All right. Now, how about maybe finding the first letter or the first line of something? Or how about going in and doing something different based on selection? Because, you know, I don't know about you, but I've never been a huge fan of the blue background white text. You know, wouldn't it be nice to kind of do a yellow highlight? I mean, really, when, when you think about highlighting, what do you think of? A highlighter. Absolutely. It's, it's funny because uh, this is something Chris really, really cares about. He made me change the highlighting in my Visual Studio yesterday to yellow. <laughs> <laughs> that is a true story. I did, in fact, do that. Yes. See, it has to be yellow. All right. <laughs> Everybody has their thing. Yeah. OK. Um, but in any event, so yes, I want to make that yellow. Now, let's compare and contrast here. So when I hover over those little links, I'm hover, hovering over the entire link, so that entire element. And if you remember, classes apply to element, so that's a pseudo class. If I highlight a section like I've done here, I've highlighted a portion of an element. So not the entire element, just a portion of the element. If we're going to be talking about first line, which is just going to be that right there, that's just that first line. So again, it's a portion of an element. So a pseudo element is where we're actually going to be creating an element on the fly. Now look, I know some of you are probably thinking, wow, that, that, that really seems to be you know, kind of splitting hairs. That's, that's really kind of a semantic <laughs> argument. And I'm with you. Um, I, I generally don't focus too much on pseudo class versus pseudo element. Um, the syntax is slightly different. You are going to notice that it's going to be a single colon versus a double colon. But here's the thing. With Visual Studio, if you hit a colon, it's automatically going to show you all of the pseudo classes, one colon, and all of the pseudo elements, two colons, right there. So 
if you don't want to have to worry about trying to remember whether or not something was um, you know two colons or one colon, you don't have to worry about it. Just you know, let, let Visual Studio kind of do its thing. And if you don't want to have to remember the, um, the, the little debate about, you know, pseudo elements versus pseudo classes, that's fine. You don't have to. That's the good news. Okay. Let's, let's, let's do a demo here. So let me do, 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 go back in and let's go grab our, uh, our little div tags and let's go in and say div and I am going to do um, our selection. And you'll notice that I typed in colon and selection. So I didn't even type in the second colon, but again, the IntelliSense still works. So let's go ahead and take advantage of that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say color colon um, black. And I'm going to say background color colon yellow. There we go. And then let's also go in and say div colon. And I'm going to say uh, my first letter. And let's go in and let's say font um, size. And let's make this nice and big. So let's say like, you know, 36 uh, pixels. And let's go in and say div um, first line. There we go. And let's go in and say font size. And let's make that um, 24. Let's also kind of make it uh, a little bit more obvious as well. Let's go in and say font um, color. Oh, it's not font color. I knew I was going to do that eventually as well. Um, and let's just make that uh, green. Okay. 24 pixels. Cool. So now, if I come back over here to Visual Studio and I hit refresh, here's what I want you to notice. Is you're going to notice, sure enough, that first line is green. And you're going to notice that that first character is nice and big. And you're also going to notice, there we go, yellow background. See, that makes me happy uh, when I go in and I select it. But my, my browser and, and all of that is set currently to full screen. So my, 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 my first line is going from, from, from here to here. OK, fine. But how about if I were to go in and I were to resize this? You'll notice that when I resize this, that it's still just that first line. I'm, there's no JavaScript here. None whatsoever. This is all based on CSS. And in fact, when we get into a later module, one of the things that I'm going to talk about is really try to avoid JavaScript. If you can get CSS to do it, let CSS do it. That's going to make your life that much easier. OK. In any event, um, let me also do this real quick. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when Christopher was highlighting, you might have noticed that the first letter was still blue when he selected it, but everything else was yellow. Um, and keep talking. And um, that's because, as we said before, it's what you select. Uh, what, what was the phrase that you used? The last. Oh, last right. Last right. Exactly. Yeah. And so you'll see in the code that um, the first uh, the selection is being used um, before. Or, I guess this is much better to say. The first child is set after the selection is set. Right. So that, in essence, overwrites that. Exactly. Exactly. And, and you could go in and start moving things around and, and tweak things. And that's where you know, going in and testing all of that really becomes uh, very important. OK. Now, um, sort of in the background, uh, one of the things that I want you to notice is I made a real quick change here. Um, and, and again, this sort of goes back to one of the things that we talked about earlier is that you'll notice that I was able to do nav a colon hover. So that's only going to apply to a tags inside of nav. And if we came back to our article, and we kind of think about what it is that I was trying to accomplish here, is I want the first paragraph to be big, because that's probably where the important stuff is. And I want the first line to be big. And I want the first letter, you know, just for stylizing things. I want that to be big. So I want all of that to, to, to really be highlighted. But I only want that, really, for just the first paragraph inside of each section. So for the second paragraph, I just want it to be normal. Just you know, back to the way that it was. And if you remember, the way that I had it the first time, which was like this, doo -doo -doo -doo. little musical interlude for you, 
There we go. Let's go back in, hit refresh. And you'll notice, here's a second paragraph right here. And you'll notice that that first line is big and it's green and my first letter is nice and big. That's not what I wanted. That's not what I wanted. I just wanted that for that first paragraph. And sure enough, we can combine all of these as much as we want. So we can get as explicit on identifying the elements as we need to. So it makes it, 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 it gives us a lot of power in going in and finding what we want. Yeah. So um, again, because I see these in the questions, yeah. um, there, why, why is it that we use uh, one one set of mm -hmm. colons for, for first child and two sets of colons for first letter. It's because, um, well, actually, Christopher, sure. can answer this. <laughs> Here, let me, let me just go in and, and, uh, and do this. Is that one set of colon, this is for our pseudo class. And then the second set of colon is a um, pseudo element. Oh. So two sets of colon is a pseudo element. The one set of colon is a pseudo class. And you know, about the best analogy that uh, that, that that I can give, and and forgive me, this is the the best one that that, that I can come up with. I took four years of French in in high school. Um, bonjour, comment allez-vous? Uh, je m'appelle Christopher. Ma grand-mère est flambée et le sang est disparu, uh, which is a horrible, horrible American accent way of saying hello. My name is Christopher. Uh, my grandmother's on fire and the monkey has disappeared. At least I think that's what I said. Um, in any event, um, one of the hardest things that, that I struggled with when I was trying to learn French was trying to remember the genders of, of, of everything, so la versus la. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think that's sort of the same thing here, is that pseudo class versus pseudo element is there a difference? Technically, yes, there is. Because pseudo class is going to apply to the entire class. When you hover over something, you're hovering over, sorry, the entire element. When you hover over something, you're hovering over that entire element. When you select something, though, or when you talk about first letter, or you talk about first line, that's a portion of an element. So hover, you're hovering over the entire element. First letter, that's a portion of an element. So hover, because of the fact that it's already going to apply to entire element, that's a class. The first letter, because of the fact that that's only a portion of an element, we need to create a brand new one. We need to do it on the fly. It's a pseudo element. That's why it's a pseudo element. It's, it's, that's honestly a very academic thing. Um, I, I wouldn't really worry about trying to commit all of that to memory and just let Visual Studio sort of guide you. I'll be honest, that's all that I ever do. The, the only time that I ever worry about pseudo class versus pseudo element is when I'm teaching CSS. <laughs> when I'm using CSS, I'm not even thinking about it, that I'm just going in, um, you know, A colon, and then just finding the item that I want, and if, if Visual Studio throws in a second colon, fantastic, and if it doesn't, fantastic. And I'm just, I'm being real here. That's the way that, uh, that I do it. I'm sure that's the way that you do it. Um, and anybody else who's experienced with, with CSS, I'm certain that's the way that they do it as well. So if you want to get very, very technical, very, very propeller head, that's the difference between the two. Personally, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Yeah. Um, some of you are also asking, why does uh, why do the pseudo classes go before the pseudo elements? And I mean, that's just, it's, it's order of, I guess, size is the best way I would put it. I mean, one, like Christopher just said, applies to the entire, the entire element. Right. I mean, the pseudo classes apply to the entire element, whatever properties put on it is for the entire element. Whereas the pseudo element is a smaller part of that. So it just, it goes from less specific to more specific. And that's the way you, you, you would order it in your CSS selector. Exactly, yeah, because that's because I'm trying to drill down into it. So I'm starting at the div tag, so I'm looking for, hey, I want a div tag. OK, now inside this div tag, I'm looking for just the first one. Yeah. And so then inside of just that first one, now I want that first letter. So I'm really just kind of drilling right yeah. down on into it. So yeah. yeah, that's a perfect way to describe it. Yeah, because it wouldn't make sense if you said, well, what is the first, what is the first uh, child of a selected line, I mean, that's not something that exactly. really makes sense. Um, yeah. Yep. Logic-wise, I don't know how yeah. about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. OK. Cool, cool, cool. So pseudo classes, pseudo elements. Um, and again, it gives you that ability to go in and find exactly what it is that, uh, that you're looking for. Now, again, those of you that have done CSS, 
you're probably looking at my demos thus far, and you're probably complaining about two very big things. The first thing that you're probably complaining about is the fact that I'm putting all my CSS into that file. Again, I'm doing that just to make my demos easier. The second thing you're probably complaining about is you'll notice that I've hard coded in all of those font sizes. So I said that I want it to be 20 pixels and 36 pixels and so forth. That's really not a good practice because the problem with that is that as things resize, I would then have to go into each item and resize it. So if I wanted a different font size for mobile, and I wanted a different font size for um, tablets, and I wanted a different font size for printing, I would then have to go in and resize everything. And I've got way too many better things to do with my time than try to you know, resize everything. So let's have a discussion then about sizing and about some sizing best practices here. Now, you are going to notice that CSS does give you the ability to do absolute sizes. And, and I'm going to say right away, just stay away from centimeters, <laughs> millimeters, and inches, um, because it's, it's never going to come out the way that you want it to. Just, just stay away from, from, from those. And really focus in on picas, points, pixels. And, and for me personally, I don't know if, you're, uh, if you use something different, I always find myself reaching for pixels, just because I find that I get the most consistency across all devices, and I find that it comes out the best. I don't know if you're yeah. different. OK. Uh, I do the same. Also, I mean, when you're sizing things besides text, it, you usually would use pixels or use, use something relative. So pixels, just across the board, it's good. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, the thing about pixels is that it's an absolute size. So if I say I want something to be this many pixels, guess how big it's going to be? That many pixels, period, end of sentence. Well, wouldn't it be nice if we could set a size somewhere as our base and then size everything else based off of that base. And that's where our relative sizes come into play. Now, the two main relative sizes that I want to highlight here are EM and REM. Now, EM is based on the font size of the current element. So if I go in and I set up, um, let's say, div, and I set that to be 16 pixels, and I want to do something based on that for the first letter, then I would want to use EM because it's based on the current element. REM, however, is an 80s, 90s alternative band. No, um, REM is based on the size of the HTML element, which, by the way, is 16 pixels by default. So let's actually go back in and kind of size things a little bit better here. So you'll notice 16 pixels up top. So rather than me going in and saying our font size of 20 pixels, let's size it based off of that main font. So I just want it a bit bigger than that main font. So let's say that I want that to be about 25% bigger. So 1.25 of REM. So you can think about it as a percent. That's always the way that, that I think about it. So 125% or 1.25 of that REM. So it's going to be a little bit bigger. And in the case of our first, we want that much, much bigger. So let's go in and maybe set that to be 2.25 REM. And in this particular case, we want that you know, a switch bigger. And let's go in and say 1.50 REM. And do I have any other sizes in here? I think I'm good. I'm good. OK, cool. So now let's come back over to my browser. And let's go ahead and hit Refresh. And you're going to notice there's not a lot of change on my screen. Because I basically kept everything reasonably close. And unless you're you know, busting out a ruler and measuring everything, you're probably not noticing any real difference until I do this. So all it takes now is for me to make one change. And I'm going to make a drastic change here. I'm going to change this to 10, which I know is very, very small. But the takeaway that I want you to get is that the moment I do that, everything else goes in line with it. And I really should also have updated this as well. Um, let's go 1.25 REM. There we go. And so now, if I resize that, you'll notice everything else goes in line with it. 
And this becomes very powerful when we're talking about our page layouts and our media queries, because I'm gonna wanna be able to resize our font for tablets and for desktops. And I don't wanna have to go in, especially if I've got something like this, where, you know, I've got, you know, like four or five different um, options now for div tags and all sorts of different font sizes. I don't wanna have to go in and resize each one of those for each individual screen size. So I don't have to. So all I have to do is one single update and everything else falls in line. Make your life easier. Go with relative sizes. Set that size once and go relative from there on out. If you need something to be an explicit size, then obviously, yes, use explicit sizing. But especially when you're talking about things like fonts and trying to work in a mobile first world, go with relative sizes. It's gonna make your life that much easier. Yeah, so, um, so what would have happened if you changed it from REM to EM? That's a fantastic question. So if I would have changed it from REM to EM, so let's, um, let's do this. I'm gonna go with um, kind of the big one here, which is our, our first letter. Um, actually, no, I want, what do I want? I want this. I'm gonna change this to EM, and I'm gonna kinda go really big here. So I'm gonna go three EM, and I'm gonna go in, and I'm gonna hit refresh here. And you'll notice that um, I'm getting a much bigger space there because of the fact that it's still coming off of my uh, HTML. So it's coming off of the parent because that's now flowing down to everything else. So EM versus REM here isn't going to make a huge difference. But let's talk about this first letter and this first line, because that's really where EM shines. Because remember, what's my goal? My goal with using that first line and that first letter was really to try and highlight that versus the rest of the paragraph. So I want that to be bigger based on the rest of the paragraph. So that's where EM is going to shine. So I don't wanna do it based off the rest of the document, I wanna do it based off of this. So I want it to be much bigger than the rest of that. So maybe I want that first letter to be three times as big as that div section. And I want that first line to be, let's say two times as big as that div section. So I go in and I say three um, EM and I say two AM and I come back and I hit refresh and you'll notice it's nice and big. Now let's again kind of keep going with that compare and contrast here. Where's my div tags? Um, trying to think of a really good, ah, okay. Let's go off of first child here. And I'm gonna explicitly size my first child here. I think this is gonna kind of bring it all together here. And I'm gonna make this really big. I'm gonna say 30 pixels. Okay. Now. This is gonna be, uh, I think, a good example of REM versus EM. EM is going to be based off of this because I've now said that that first child, I want that to be 30 pixels. EM is gonna be based off of that. So this should be 90 pixels big as opposed to whatever was inside of HTML, which if I remember right, uh, was currently set to 10, so it should be 30. So if it was REM, that would be 30. EM is gonna be 90 pixels. I think I'm doing my math right. Hit save, hit refresh. Yes, that's 90 pixels. So you'll notice that that's huge. And you'll also notice kind of as a perfect example that that up there wasn't impacted. That's still going to be, in this case, are 10 pixels. So there's the difference in inaction of EM versus REM. So EM is based off of that current element. REM is based off of whatever was set on HTML. Does that bring that together? Yeah, I think okay. so. Okay, cool. All right, now, up until now, I've, uh, okay, I've gotta fix that. Hold on one second. <laughs> control Z, that's just gonna drive me crazy. Um, control Z, and Control <laughs> Z, and let's go back and change that to um, 16. Okay, now then. All right, so what I'm gonna do um, is I'm gonna bring this back up in, um, in Internet Explorer, and I'm gonna fire up uh, Chrome here. Now, what you're gonna notice is, on the whole, these are similar, but you are, excuse me, gonna notice that they're certainly not the same, that the font size 
is definitely different in Chrome versus IE. And this is going to be one of the biggest challenges that you're going to have working with CSS is that, um, like you mentioned earlier, and I think you put it perfectly, which was essentially that CSS is a standard by the W3C, and they essentially suggest that browsers do this, this, and this. But it's not a requirement by any stretch of the imagination. So a lot of different things will work in one browser, but won't necessarily work in another browser. And sometimes the, the difference is going to be pretty drastic. Sometimes it's not going to be as bad. So you will always have to go in and play around from browser to browser to browser to make Make sure that things work well in, in all browsers, or at least are kind of close enough um, in, uh, in all browsers. And so you'll notice on the sizing here that the sizing is going to be handled. Oh, wait a minute. No. I'm sorry. There we go. See, it was funny because I'm looking at this and I'm going, I know that all of that's supposed to work in Chrome, and it's not, and I'm just going to kind of roll with it. There we go. OK. So all of that works better. There we go. Now. Here's one spot where things can differ, and Chrome may have updated this um, real recently. So if all of a sudden this works the way that it's supposed to work in Chrome, um, then they, they updated it. One very cool thing that you can do is you can also size things based on the screen size. And that's by using VW or VH. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that it's not supported in all browsers. And you'll notice that it winds up being that unit of measurement is a one is 1% 1 of the viewport, so the portion of the screen that you're currently looking at, the width and the height. So if I go back in to Visual Studio here, and let me grab my article, and let's say that I want my article's width and I only want that to take up, let's say, 75% of the screen, I could say 75 VW, viewport width. And so if I go in and I hit save, and I come back over here to Chrome, and I come back over here to Internet Explorer, OK, cool. Um, ah, Chrome did update this. This actually um, is relatively new. Um, what you're going to notice? is that there is now that little bit of white space, and it's all based on the size of the browser. Now, the point that I was really trying to make here, kind of bringing it all the way back to where I started by opening up Chrome, is you do have to be careful with CSS because things change over time. So it was like two months ago that I went, last went in and kind of worked around with that, and that wasn't there, that wasn't supported. It is now supported. You always have to test in all browsers. Always have to test in all browsers. OK. All right. Any, anything else to there? Um, I, think, no, I think that was a really good explanation of different sizes. I think especially the discussion of REM versus EM, that sizing thing. Yeah. Great explanation. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, uh, let's go ahead and take a 10-minute break. And then we're going to come on back and we're going to take a look at, uh, at page layout. So we took a look at how to go in and select all of our items. Now it's time to actually examine how we can put things where we want them and stop using tables. <laughs> all right, we'll see you guys in 10 minutes. All right, well, uh, welcome back to uh, the uh, Anning style with CSS uh, Jumpstart. Uh, I'm Christopher Harrison, that is uh, Helen Zhang. And uh, in the last couple of modules, we sort of focused in, uh, not sort of, we did, we focused in on kind of the basics of, hey, you know, here's CSS. And then we got a little bit more advanced, and we took a look at how to go in and highlight and find all sorts of different sections. But we didn't really focus a whole lot on how to lay out the page. I mean, if you took a look at my page example, I mean, it was still relatively kind of ugly as far as layouts and all of that went. So it'd be nice if we talk about page layout. What do you say? Yeah. So a lot of you have actually also been asking questions about this, saying, you know, like, it, it's great. We, we want to know how to especially, you know, change text size. but. How am I supposed to change the width and height of something? How am I supposed to lay out the page? At the end of the day, that 
That's a very important part in actually making your site look good. Stop uh, using tables. Yeah, so we're going to talk about a couple of things. We're going to talk about how to position your elements on the page. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how to make something stay at the top of the page, how to make uh, elements uh, sit next to each other nicely, how to center things. Um, you know, how, how to position those elements, as well as what goes into sort of the position of an element. What is, not to get too philosophical here, but what <laughs> is an element? You know, what is it, seriously, yeah. what is it composed of? Um, which is the box model, you know, an element is not simply the content, it's also the stuff around the content. <laughs> <laughs> so an element isn't just an element, there's more to it than yes. just simply just that, 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 that individual tag. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and we're also going to talk about how elements can interact with each other and sort of disrupt each other on a page, um, and how we can solve those issues. Okay. So, um, so, so at the end of the slide, or at the end of this module, I'm hoping to get a page like this. So you know, it's not beautiful, but it's a rough estimate of what a landing page, what a pretty modern day landing page would look like. And we're going to basically position all these elements that I put in here um, and get from this mm -hmm. to this. Perfect. I love it. Great. So first, um, we should talk about the display property. I mean, this really gets an element to actually display on a page. And there's a, there's a lot of different HTML elements, as you guys well know. Um, and there are a couple types, two main types, really. The first is a block level element. And that, those are the typical elements that you're thinking of, um, paragraphs, divs, forms, headings, you know, anything that really takes up an entire row for itself on the page. Mm -hmm. There are also then inline elements like spans, um, links. You know, if you're if you're using the B tag or bolding something, that's an inline element, um, and they don't take up an entire page. You can think of these roughly as you know things that could go inside of a paragraph or inside of something else. Okay. Um, and I think that's an easy shortcut to think about it. Not exactly, but that gets you into the right idea. Um, and you can also display things not only as block or as inline, you can also hide, completely hide an element from the page using display none. Um, and that's a bit different from something else that you might have heard about called visibility none. Visibility none basically takes an element and hides it, but still ha like basically has a placeholder size for it on the page. Display none actually hides an element altogether. So um, you know if you had three things and you hit the middle one, then it would basically collapse into two. Whereas if you use visibility none, you would basically have one and then a blank space and then three. That makes so sense. display none completely disappears. Visibility, there's nothing that's going to be there, but it's just going to be white space, if if you will. That's right. There. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, something funny I saw was you know it's it's basically like a ninja. It's there, but you don't see it. <laughs> or an invisibility cloak. Okay. Um, I like it. I like it. Um, yeah. One little thing that's worth highlighting, though, um, is especially for people who are doing server side, is that that HTML is still sent down to the client. So if somebody went in and viewed the source, they'd still be able to see the text behind the scenes. They're just not seeing it on the browser screen. Yeah, it's just a good way to sort of dynamically hide elements on the page mm -hmm. if you need to do that. Um, you know, for instance, we'll get into this later on. But if you're resizing um, a page, like based on screen size, it's very helpful there. And then there's a no, no, go ahead. Is that confusing? No. Okay, no. great. Um, and there's I, last thing. I just always have this confused look <laughs> on my face. It's just me. <laughs> okay, just checking. Um, <laughs> but the last thing that could be a little bit confusing is that there's an inline block type element. So a block type element, you know, typically needs a whole row for itself. An inline block element basically allows you to collapse a bunch of um, block elements onto the same row. So, you know, for example, if you had like three cards that you want to show on the same page, each in a little div, you would be able to do that by setting them to inline blocks rather than just block elements. Okay. Um, so actually, if we go to my example here, you can see that these are all, you know, inline blocks, but without styling, they're, they're just block elements. They're just sitting, you know, one behind each other. So like those this. are all contained inside of div tags, and so the div tags are just going to go top to bottom there. Yeah, and I can show you that in the F12 tools, you'll see, I mean, they're just like very basic boxes, mm -hmm. um, and they don't have, you know, an inline block element like the, or inline block property like these do. Let me open this up. Uh, yeah, you'll see they're, they're shown as display inline block. Okay. And you can also see that if you, let me disable this, they automatically oh. go back to being you know, okay. one behind another. 
All right. So, so that normal block is just going to go down, down, down. That inline block is, it, they're still separate elements, but they're not automatically going to go down to the next line, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I mean, it, it's a pretty common use case. Yeah, you Sometimes you don't want everything to go one single file down the page. Sometimes you just want two things next to each other. Right. And that makes it easy, or makes it possible even. Um, something else that we should talk about, the second most important thing in show, having a having something show up on the page is the position property. So the display, you know, makes sure it shows up, but the position actually talks about where it is. Mm -hmm. Or how to how to determine where it is, shall I say. Um, so the first type is, so there's a, whoa, there's a couple of types for this. The first is static, and that's basically the default, completely unformatted way of um, having a position. So it'll just sit exactly where it should be on the page um, by default. The second is relative. So that is relative to where its default position would be on a page. So for instance, you know, if something is in the, um, if something is a first element, so if it was, let me, you know, if you had an element that was, oh, how do I do this? Ah, uh, never mind. Basically. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, basically, you had an element in the top right corner of something, and you want to shift that down a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. shift it down by 100 pixels or maybe 10% um, based on the page. You would use a relative because you're basically trying to just move the element relative to where its original place would be. Um, the next one is fixed, and that's just relative to the browser window. And this is especially useful for you know headers, for instance, you've seen it on a lot of web pages probably that move with you as you scroll. And the last is um, an absolutely placed element. These, I think, are less commonly used, um, and they're a little, and they can kind of be confusing. Um, absolute elements are put basically exactly where you where you position it. So if you give it, um, so if you give it, you know, I want it to be from the top of the page 100 pixels, from the left of the page 100 pixels. It'll just be right there, and nothing else will move it. It doesn't listen to any of the other elements. Whereas a lot of these other ones, um, they they relate to other things. Like, for example, the fix uh, is relative to the browser window, and the rel and rel position is relative to where its default place is. So um, let me show you an example of that. Yeah, go in and see it. That's yeah. always sort of the best way. Yeah. So for instance, um, this header right here is a fixed element, right? So when you're moving down the page, it's fixed relative to the browser window. Nice. So you didn't do any JavaScript or anything fancy like that. You just simply said fix. Yeah. Um, it, in fact, if you look at my HTML code, there's absolutely no JavaScript on this page because I just want to, to make clear that everything that happens here is based purely um, on CSS. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have any absolutely placed elements on this page because there it didn't actually seem like it was necessary <laughs> to have you know something just randomly in this cor uh, in the upper left hand corner or you know right something yeah. like that on the page. Plus uh, those would actually you know scroll with you, so as you're moving past it, it would just go away. And um, the absolutely position elements are also just not very flexible, obviously, because you're putting them in one place and they won't necessarily move uh, or shift according to the layout in a pleasant way. So um, now that we sort of ha have the groundwork for how all these elements are placed, um, let's actually go through and place the and place our sort of mismatch elements on our other page. OK, so we'll start with, with that, that, that ugly page and actually prettify it. Yeah, exactly. You'll see okay. in the header here, uh, this is in a list. Uh, we'll, of course, you know, make those in line, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll make all of this work. But let's uh, start by doing some of our position and element stuff. So, so this is a base CSS file that I have for that page. Um, as you can see, you know, a lot of these things are actually styled a little bit. Like there's, there are these boxes. Um, you know, I yep. changed the background color. These aren't important to positioning. So I just put that in there. So we're not stay, starting with a completely blank page. <laughs> that, I, I tried it. I tried to put that in the demo. That actually does take Forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so and, and you had to get rid of that serif font. Uh, of course. I just <laughs> the first thing you have to do. Although, um, like what Chris had before, you know, something that's nice to put here is in case they don't have Arial. I don't really know people who won't have Arial. You can yeah. put sans serif um, just to you know have a fallback. Arial, okay. Perdana, they're basically always there. Yeah. Yeah. They're the good go-tos. Um, OK, so something we haven't talked So first, we're going to position our header on the page. And something that we haven't really talked about yet is uh, width and height. So, um, 
and these are pretty self-explanatory mm -hmm. elements of um, there's pretty self-explanatory properties of an element. The width, you know, determines how wide it is, and height determines how how tall it is. And uh, so you see that I have put a couple of different positions in here. For the header, uh, I stretch it to 100%. And that is 100% basically of what its parent element is. But because header, um, you can see in my HTML file here, it does it, it is sitting right here. It doesn't really have a uh, parent element besides body. Um, and body is just 100% of the page, obviously. Um, that'll automatically stretch to 100% of that page. OK, so, so just to, to sort of reiterate that, uh, that width at 100% is based on the parent element. It's not based on the browser window. And it just so happens that this is inside of body, so that's why it's 100% of the entire window, because body is the entire window. Yeah. OK. Yeah, I mean, if you want, we can go through and we can show this to be, uh, if we change body to be with 50%, and this would just, you know. Um, or I guess we should do 500 pixels to make that a bit more clear. Ah, I like that. OK. Um, and we refresh this. Yeah, you'll see that this, I mean, the entire body is now 500 pixels. And then, but the header block is still 100% of the width here. OK. So you'll see here, I mean, body is just that 500 pixel across. Mm -hmm. And then so is header, though, because it's 100% of that. I like it. Yeah, so let's go through and undo this. We don't want you know, that kind of a page. Um, and we are, we're also setting height here. We're setting height um, in pixels. So as Christopher talked about before, there are a bunch of ways that you could set these values. And um, in here, setting, uh, setting element sizes as well as text sizes, you can use things like EM um, to, to make it relative to the to size of text. I'm just going pixels here because that makes sense. You want, you want your header to be at the top of the page at a fixed height. Um, so I'm just setting it to that. And what I'm going to do now is going back to positioning, I'm going to set its position to actually be fixed. So it sits at the top of the page. OK. So let's see what happens now. So you just made one little change there. You just simply said fixed. Yeah. Um, I simply said fixed for the position. And now if you see when I start scrolling, that element stays at the top of the page. Now it's worth noting that you know, there's some spacing issues. Um, we're going to get to that in the box model part. Okay. So don't worry about that for now. All right. Um, we're also going to change some of the elements in our header because you'll see we don't want our header to be uh, or our header links to be vertical. We want them to be horizontal on the page like this. Okay. So we can do that by simply making these uh, list items uh, inline mm -hmm. instead of block like they are by default. And so what we can basically do for that is we can say display inline. And once we save that, when we refresh here, they'll, of course, be in a line. OK. All right. So by default, it was block. So boom, 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 down the list. And now inline, it's all going to be horizontal. Exactly. So yeah, inline just allows these elements to sit next to each other. Um, it's, not, it, it's not necessary to use you know, inline block for, for elements like this, where they're still small and you know, they could be part of, like, like I said before, you know, something that could be part of a paragraph, like, mm -hmm. I, um, like I said before, uh, I just use inline. But we will use inline block for a couple of other things. So I'm just tabbing all over the place here. Um, you'll see in this page, you know, for instance, we have these two elements. We have this sort of side text here and this image being on the same line. And you can achieve that using inline block. OK. We also have all of these sort of uh, cards here of all the, all the things that we theoretically teach <laughs> in each of our modules. I left I like them it. blank. I was going to put some lorem ipsum in there. But then it just seemed like we were teaching you rubbish. So <laughs> I left them blank for now. Um, but yeah, these are also inline block. And actually, one nice thing about inline block is that um, they automatically sort of re um, they automatically will reseat themselves oh, nice. uh, based okay. on your, your viewport size or um, your browser. So uh, at, so those kind of adapt depending on your display. Okay. Uh, so we're going to set two things to inline block. We're going to set uh, uh, three things to inline block. We're going to set uh, the side text mm -hmm. and this image to inline block. And we're also going to set all of these boxes to inline block. OK. So in Visual Studio, um, you'll see, OK, let me show you the code for this first. You'll see that the banner text and uh, your, the banner text is you know, that large header that we had. And the mm -hmm. side text and a CSS image are what we want side by side. So that's you know, within the hero block. 
and it's, imp and it's important to note that you know when these are inline, they're inline relative to their parent. Mm -hmm. Um, and our boxes are not actually IDs, but they're classes since they're all this, they're all the same style. It's it just makes sense to put them in a class rather than giving them all individual IDs and styling each of those. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to set this to display inline block. That'll set all the boxes, and we're also going to set our where is it? Side text display to inline block. And our CSS image to display inline block. And so now, when we, oh, when we refresh this page, you'll see that they're, they're on the same line again. Um, okay. Now, there are some issues with the positioning. For instance, uh, this transform transitions because it has a two-line title. It's <laughs> up a little bit. And um, this side text is sort of, uh, it's aligned to the bottom rather than the top of, with this image, which is what we want. Um, and that is mostly because of how the CSS box model works. Okay. Uh, which is something that we're going to talk about. You know, why is that happening? Right. Um, and the CSS box model basically describes you know, uh, what are all the components of an element on the page. It's not just the content, right? It's also all the things that go around it. So, um, so there. So you could think of the CSS box model as actually just a box. Um, there's some content in the middle, and then between the content and the border, which you can set um, to a certain style, you could have the padding. Mm -hmm. So everything that's sort of inside here is inside the element, and then outside of this is the margin, which is basically the space that you want other elements to stay away from you on. So <laughs> a good way to think about this is, for instance, if you set the background of um, if you set the background of this entire element, it would go, it would, or it would go sort of like this in sort of color. It would go from the padding on, right? Okay. So, so that, so that would encompass all of the color, um, and but the margin would stay clear because that's sort of viewed as outside of the the border of it. Mm -hmm. Now, um, so the margin is a space outside of an element. The border is the visible border around the element. And the padding is a space within the element, but outside of the actual content that you have inside of it. Um, this is kind of a little bit confusing, because when you think about um, a box, oh, actually, yeah, when you think of, about the size of a box, uh, you don't really think about the size of it, including like some space around it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you're really thinking about the size of that of a box, right? So if you had a cardboard box and you're measuring the side of it, you, you would be measuring from the outside of the box on one side to the outside mm -hmm. of the box on the other side. You wouldn't necessarily go inside it and just like measure how, how much the box can store. <laughs> that doesn't really make sense as, as a way of measuring. And so there's something called um, the box sizing attribute um, that, that really changes this and makes that much easier. So basically, instead of um, so instead, you can change this to border box so that it will actually measure your um, when you do your, when you're doing width. It'll measure from here to here, and that'll be sort of the width of the box, okay. and uh, which I think makes sense when you're talking intuitively about an element. And then here to here, sorry, as uh, I don't really know how to use zoom it, so I'm just drawing squares as lines or drawing boxes. As lines. <laughs> that's good. Hope that's okay with you guys. So yeah, so now if you're using the box sizing as border box, um, this would be the height. And this would be the width instead of before, where you know it would encompass other things. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. um, and the box sizing, that's one of those new attributes that's, that we talked about. So um, that's a CSS3 thing. Yeah, it's a okay. CSS3 thing. So um, so you set it to be so it does actually need a vendor prefix specifically for uh, Mozilla Firefox. Um, so you, you're going to actually need two things. You're going to need a border box, um, to, you're going to need to set box sizing, and you're also going to set dash moz dash box sizing. Unfortunately, Visual Studio does that for you. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But um, those are just some of the, you know, some of the quirks that we talked about with CSS implementation, mm -hmm. and this is one of the places where it does come up. So, um, so where are the places that we need to actually set box sizing on our page? Well, um, a good example is actually right here in the header. So um, let's say, so let's say we want our text here uh, to not be, you know, sort of not. We want our text to be more centered at vertically uh, in our header. So if so, to do that, you know, maybe we can add in some padding on top. 
to kind okay. of push the element down a little bit. Now, what would that look like? That's a good question. What would that look like? Yeah, so, so you would set that in header, and you basically set some padding to basically push elements down inside of it, down a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do padding. Um, you can do padding top to just basically set the, uh, the top of that mm -hmm. to, I'm going to say, 10 pixels. By the way, while you're there, um, mm -hmm. can I ask you a real quick side question? Because there's a, a question in the Q&A about, about the Z index. Ah, OK. Yeah, the Z index is, um, OK. So I'll explain why we need it first. And I think that would make a lot more sense. Yep. So on this page, you'll see if as we're scrolling down, um, Everything this, else goes behind. Yeah, everything is going behind this. Uh, and by default, things are at Z index 1. Um, by setting the Z index you're base, uh, to a higher number, you're basically saying this element is in front of all the other elements. Mm. Uh, if we set it to something like negative 1, um, then all, these all the other elements would kind of go in front of it, which doesn't make sense as a um, fixed header, right. because then you can't really see it anymore. Things are getting <laughs> in the way. Uh, so that's why I'm setting the Z index. OK. Yeah. Perfect. And I just set it to 10. So I like to set things by order of magnitude, not by like 1, 2, or 3. <laughs> um, it, I think it makes things a lot more clear. And that way, you can have some granularity if you need it. Yep. So yeah, I'm setting this padding top to 10 pixels um, for, for this unfinished page. And you'll see that if I refresh the page, I do have more of a padding on top. But it also pushes down the size. Um, it also increases the size of this top header a little bit. And if we look into or if we look in our F12 tools and we look at the header, we can actually see its layout size here. And you'll see that there's a, some padding here on top um, in addition to the 70 pixels, right? And that sort okay. of, and that increases in like a weird way so that this entire thing becomes 80 pixels instead of 70. And we don't want that. We want it to be 70 forever. <laughs> so uh, the way that you can fix that is, like I said, you can set box sizing. So um, I'll just do box sizing border box. And um, for our Mozilla, we'll just go in and do this. And that basically sets a border box specifically for Mozilla. Um, the box sizing thing works uh, pretty, the box sizing works out of the box for all the other browsers. Out of the box? Box sizing out of the box? <laughs> Unintentional fun, but uh, I'm still going to take credit for it. By the way, um, do this for me real quick. Um, hit a carriage return um, and type in box sizing again. Um, and one of the things that, that um, uh, everybody will notice, um, whoops, um, uh, uh, hit backspace uh, one more. Uh, OK, you're going to have to delete it and bring it back up again. Um, I, I just want the IntelliSense back up. OK. So, box, um, so you'll notice on box sizing that there's like a little pair of scissors that's next to that. So that's a snippet. So with that highlighted, if you hit tab twice, it'll automatically put in all of the different vendor-specific versions that, uh, that you need. So that way, you don't have to remember each one of them. So Visual Studio can actually do that for you. That's really cool. I didn't know that. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, you, and you can just change these elements uh, directly. Exactly. Yep. Um, it does have the WebKit box sizing here, but WebKit has now rolled that into their standards, so you don't need it anymore. Right. Um, unless you do want to target, you know, older versions, in which case that's decent practice. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. But we'll go with that for now. Okay. So we're going to save this, and now, when you go and refresh this page, um, you'll see that this has again become seventy pixels. Ten pixels isn't a huge difference, so you might not be able to see it too clearly. But um, here, if I select this element, you can see now You know, it's kind of pushed mm. in that element size a little bit to account for that padding. Okay. So now, instead of um, it being 80 from uh, like accounting for padding, now it's 70, even accounting for padding. And that's on the F12 tools, that layout tab. And that's showing you the full box. So that way, you can see the sizing of, uh, of the box and, and how everything's coming together. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. Yeah, these can be um, really finicky, so it's nice to actually see all these things. Yep. And it's especially nice to have this, um, oh, to have the element selection tool to be able to actually select these. No. Yep. Yeah, so we're, we want to set the box sizing for that. Um, and we also want to set sort of the, and we don't need to set the box sizing for everything, um, but we might need to set the padding for some things. Um, so I don't know if you guys can have noticed, but there's actually supposed to be, you know, this, this huge title 
line here, a banner text that says add style with CSS jumpstart. And that's completely hidden here. It's hidden behind the nav bar. Uh, that's a problem. Yeah, that is a problem. Um, and the way I'm going to fix that is I'm basically just going to, um, in the hero block, which is comprised of basically everything in this blue box, um, I'm going to set some padding on top um, to basically push the elements inside down a little bit. OK. Oh, actually, I want to show you guys how to set padding for basically all four sides at the same time. OK. So, so instead of you know doing padding top, you could just simply do padding. Um, and you can put in four values. Okay. And the values basically go top, right, bottom, left, in that order. So starting from the top going clockwise. Exactly. So top, right, bottom, left. Yeah. And okay. so you put in four values. Um, and for this, since I'm only setting top, I'm going to set um, 70, which is the size of the header. And then I'm going to do 0, 0, 0. I, I don't bother putting pixels in for the other <laughs> ones, because 0 is the same, basically on any scale. It's nothing. Um, it's worth noting, <laughs> right? I suppose 0 is 0. Yeah. Um, oh, but if you do just omit the other numbers, then that basically gives you a 70 pixel padding all around. So on all four sides, it'll give you 70. Whereas if you set all, um, each side separately, it'll, it'll know um, that you yeah. want all of them to be different. Perfect. In our case, it won't matter too much, but I'm just going to set it like this because that makes sense to me. And now we can see add style with CSS. Yeah, yep. exactly. And now that's sort of pushed everything else down on the page, um, which is exactly what we're looking for. OK, so now um, we also, so now the elements are sort of in the right positions on the page, but they're not aligned in the way that they, we want them to be. Right. Or they're not you know, floated on, this, on the side of the page like this that we want them to be. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to talk about that next. You know, what happens after you, you size elements? Um, they still need to interact with each other, mm -hmm. right? And so the, the first thing that we're going to talk about is the float property. This is probably the most commonly used property for you know, um, anchoring things anchoring elements on a page. This horizontally anchors an element basically on its row. So you can, if you flow elements to the left, it'll stay on the left side. And if you flow elements to the right, um, it's going to stick basically onto the right side. Um, so, and it also allows other elements to flow around the page. So I have an example down here of basically what um, a blue box floated onto the right would be. be um, you'll see that the text is, you know, able to flow sort of around it. Mm -hmm. And this was the original use case for float. I mean, when, uh, when CSS first started, it, HTML was also intended to be you know, basically a document, right? right? So it was intended to basically float images around and let text go around this. But since then, float has been sort of co-opted to do other things. And those other things do include um, like basically anchoring an element um, on its row. So, so one of the elements that we want to anchor is our like large CSS3 badge. Mm -hmm. We want to anchor that onto the right like this. I know this isn't really pretty, but it does give you a good indication of you know what floating something onto the right would be. Absolutely. You'll, you'll also notice that there's some space right here between it and the right side. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to show you what that would look like basically if I didn't have the margin there. Um, yeah, so this is my image, and I'm, right now I'm giving it a 10% margin to the right. That way it scales with the page size. If I didn't have that, it would just go directly to the right. I got you. So we're going to set a couple of things. We're going to set um, its float, and we're also going to give it a little margin so it doesn't float just on the edge. So in here, we'll say float right. And we're also going to do margin um, right. 10%. Whoa. 10%. I need to find percent. OK, great. <laughs> um, and similarly, we want to set the, the left margin for our text um, to not you know, be exactly on the right, uh, left edge of the page, but you know, have a little bit of buffer. So I'm going to do margin left on this. And I'm going to do 10% as well, so it looks a little centered. And now, if we refresh our sort of demo, um, it'll go like this. Whoa. All right. What happened? Well, <laughs> um, that's, we got halfway there, yeah. sort of, and then we made a mess of a few other things. Yeah. And this actually happened because, um, well, this is, this is one of those things where elements interacting on the page can do bad things. So um, <laughs> right now, 
basically what happened is um, our hero, hero block said, oh, wait, if you want to put it there and these are next to each other and this text is here, then uh, this element is actually going to be too big to fit in our box. So basically, it like floated it here and then it, it sort of stranded it outside of the box. <laughs> um, there, there's a pretty good way of just making sure everything that you want inside of the box stays in there, um, and that's using the overflow property. Um, so you know, if elements sort of flow, like overflow from that div, mm -hmm. it, the, the div will just simply enlarge itself to um, account for it, instead of simply saying, well, I guess, uh, I guess you're out there on your own. <laughs> so I'm going to say overflow auto. And that should take care of that. OK, so that'll automatically resize. Exactly. Okay. So basically, it'll say, if an element overflows it, overflows our our div, don't don't just leave it hanging. Bring it back in. <laughs> we'll we'll enlarge ourselves to keep it in here. Okay. One of my favorite little tricks to do with the uh, with the overflow is to use that scroll. Uh, so that way, rather than having to use iframes, you can just set up the the div tag. It's got you know that huge block of text, and you just want scrollability inside of there. If you set that overflow to scroll, it'll automatically just put in a scroll bar inside of there, um, which is uh, I think a neat little trick. Yeah, exactly. So you can have you know a little text box uh, with with a scroll bar next to it instead of having a huge chunk of text exactly. that would take up the entire page. Exactly. So like, you know, I, I see this happening all the time. Like when you're buying new software, they're like getting you to sign yep. the terms and conditions. That's just, you know. <laughs> they, they could be using iframe, but most likely it's going to be an overflow scroll. It, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Um, and now. Th those terms and conditions that everybody reads from, from start to finish. <laughs> Oh, I definitely do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one thing that I promised you guys I would do that I haven't yet done is I haven't fixed this sort of margin here mm -hmm. uh, that's happening w with basically in the entire body of the of the document, and that's because body actually has some default padding and margin on it, um, and you know this this actually does vary a little bit from between browser to browser, and but I don't know that. I would ever want some space there. So generally, what I do is I set uh, margin of the body to just be zero. I want it to take up the entire screen. And I also want there to be no padding. Uh, so you know, elements uh, within the body just you know, go from side to side exactly where I would expect it. OK. And once I save that, um, and that I does sort of make sense. I mean, that's that's the screen where it's displaying. Just give me the entire screen. Yeah. Why why would I want blank space there? Like yeah. I don't understand. Um, <laughs> and but, yeah, this is just across sort of every browser essentially. But now that we've updated that, you'll see that it's now smooth here again. Mm -hmm. um, and the last thing that we want to do with padding is we actually want to pad probably each of these links. So it's not just one chunk of text together, right. but um, they actually have some padding left and right. And you can set padding for things uh, for even inline elements. If they're not only for block elements. So I'm going to go back in here, and you'll see I, I did this um, the descendant selector like we learned before mm -hmm. for for all because all the list items within our header are going to be links. Um, or yeah, link outs. So I just set it there instead. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do just some padding to the right. Right. Um, I'm right. going to set that to 20 pixels just to give it a little bit of padding. I'm not going to do left and right because you know all of them just can the, go 20 yeah, over. Yeah, they would combine, and now you've got 40 pixels. Yeah, exactly. Them. And yeah. this is just much more exact. I don't want to have to divide it by half. Um, and you'll see that now this is separated a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But now we also want these to be on the center of the page. I mean, everything else is sort of centered. It's it's nice to have things centered. Um, and actually, what is interesting is that is that centering can you know, once you have inline elements, centering uh, can happen to basically all of them. So we can center all of these links here, and we can center these inline block cards on uh, okay. boxes on the bottom using the same thing. And it's going to be text align. So I know that the boxes on the bottom aren't texts, <laughs> but that is how you indeed uh, align them to be more centered. So it's so. sort of like the reverse of the old um, uh, color, where color is just for the text. Here you actually want to apply to the element. You're going to use text as the prefix. Yeah. Um, this is just, you know, just a simple way to center your inline elements. There are other ways as well. People you know, set the margins. Mm -hmm. um, but I find this to be fairly straightforward. So I'm going to set this. Um, so I'm going to set the block. Uh, so actually, uh, I'm setting the 
the textile line center, not to the boxes themselves, but to the container of the boxes. Okay. So that everything that goes inside that container, which are all the boxes, are automatically centered. So I'm going to set that to here. And then similarly, I'm not going to set these, um, the, the header list items, to be text align centered. The entire header. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to set the entire header to be text align. And uh, while Helen's telling, typing this out, one of the things that's worth noting um, is with the IntelliSense inside of um, Visual Studio is it will pick up if you happen to type in the middle of something. So if you forget that it's text align, if you just type align, text align will still show up in the IntelliSense, which is really nice. Yeah, that's very useful. Because yeah, you might not always remember that it's text align to align yeah. some elements. Um, but yeah, so once we have that, now we, if we just refresh the page, okay. you'll see that these elements on top in the header are, of course, aligned but uh, in the center. But also, these are uh, centered as well on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So now, once we minimize the page, I mean, they're always going to be sort of centered. Um, they're not going to look very good, unfortunately, because uh, as you can see, we still have sort of this like off-kilter um, alignment there. And that's because um, we haven't actually told inline elements how to align themselves like you can um, so so what we're going to do is we're actually going to say okay all of these elements in this box uh, or all of these elements align yourselves according to the top mm -hmm. so so basically all you guys should start at the um, at the same top edge so we're going to go in here and then for each of these boxes we're going to say top align oh well, let's see. Vertical. Vertical, yes. Vertical align. We're going to set vertical align to top. Ah, that's where <laughs> I mix myself up. <laughs> um, so once I set my vertical align to top, um, once we refresh this, you'll see that they're on the same row, which is great, except now they're kind of touching the hero block. And all that we need to do for that is we basically need to set some margin for, for the container that these boxes are going to be in. So if we go back here in the modules block um, next to text or under text align centered, we just basically need to give this some um, margin. We'll just go margin top um, 50 pixels or so. And once we jump back here and we refresh the page, we'll see that it has some some margin here. Okay, perfect. So now this yeah er, is already looking basically like this. Um, you'll see that all these boxes are text aligned on top, but because we set the sizes of all the boxes, they're still the same size, it's not pushed down a little bit, because we said all these boxes would be um, you know, exact squares. Mm -hmm. so, so, I, so I hope that gives you a little bit of flavor of how to position all of these, ele all of these different elements onto the page. This is not for the record, how I would recommend you build your own web page. Um, I would definitely say you, know, you should put much more styling onto these pages. Of course. Or you can go for a framework like Bootstrap, mm -hmm. which actually does a lot of you know, the centering, the pulling elements left and right for yep. you as classes that you can call. And I think that's, it's much cleaner. Yeah. It's much, much cleaner than what we're doing here. Yep. But what I hope to show is you know, how you can position those elements um, on your own, or mm -hmm. how you can modify the positioning of elements within Bootstrap if you're using something like that, or using another CSS framework. I really liked how you kind of started with just sort of, hey, here's a, a, a clean slate, and everything kind of a mess, and added a couple little properties, and added a couple little properties, and then, OK, now I've got this here, I've got this here, I've got this here. And that really is sort of the, the typical development with CSS, is you'll go in, you'll add something, let's see how it looks, go in, add something, let's see how it looks, and kind of build that iteratively, that step by step. So yeah. I really dig that. Yeah, I find that if you add too many properties, at the same time. Um, in CSS, you just go in, it's a mess, and then you have to open your developer tools anyway to like, look at which properties yeah. should not be affecting it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Perfect. All right, well, are you hungry? A little bit, yeah, I'm getting All right. there. All right, I'm hungry. What do you say we take a meal break and we'll come on back in, uh, in about an hour? Sound yeah. good? Sounds good. All right, we'll see you guys in about an hour. Okay. All right, well, uh, welcome back. Hopefully you enjoyed whatever it was that, uh, that you just uh, ate. 
Um, this is uh, the editing style with CSS Jumpstart uh, alongside uh, Helen Zhang. I am uh, Christopher Harrison. And uh, we left off taking a look at how to go in and lay out our page and position everything. And one of the things that, that you did, which I thought was really neat, was that when you resize the browser, all of those boxes kind of just automatically fell right in and, um, uh, and went from there. So, you know, I, I'm thinking that it'd be nice to just have your entire higher, um, you know, page do things based on the browser size, based on the device size, so that way when somebody does open it up inside of a desktop or inside of a phone, that we'll be able to, uh, to kind of see the whole thing and, 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 and have that scale properly. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, I think that's actually a very highly requested item for us to cover. <laughs> so yeah, appropriately, we're going to talk about media queries uh, right now. Okay. So media queries are, you know, one of those things that it's, it's been around for actually a long time. I mean, media queries have been used to just format pages basically for, mm -hmm. for printing. If you've ever noticed, even you know, back in the day, if you printed a page and it looked different than from when you were looking at your screen, that was already a media query. Okay. Uh, yeah, but uh, now there's obviously a lot more to media queries. Right. So uh, today we're going to cover a couple of things. We're going to cover you know, how to query for different screens and different devices, um, as well as different screen resolutions, different aspect ratios. Um, and we're also going to talk about, you know, how do we change up content on the page or reflow the page mm -hmm. based on uh, those parameters. Mm -hmm. So that all is done in CSS. And there are, of course, ways to do, you know, responsive web design in things that are... <laughs> there we go. Sorry. I, I could tell I was being signaled for something, but I wasn't quite sure what. Now I know. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, there are other ways to do responsive web design. Um, the, the meta viewport tag, for example, is, is something that is used quite commonly. But we're going to cover uh, just media queries in CSS. Okay. So um, the first thing we're going to talk about is you know, how to query for basically different screens and different devices. And when we do that, I want to first cover um, you know, what are some good media queries? What are some good examples of media queries? Why do we need them? Mm -hmm. So I have two examples that I wanted to show you guys. Um, the first is a list apart. This is actually a pretty great uh, website if you're just in general um, interested in web design and want to and want to ha like read some great literature on that. So, so this is basically an online web uh, magazine on web design. And you can see right now that our screens are pretty big. Maybe you can't see that. But um, <laughs> you, can, you can actually see a lot of content on this page. And you see that the text is, um, and the text is quite large. But they do, they do account for it when you're scaling down the page. So you can see my window is maximized. Now as I am making that page smaller, you see that the image up top, this header image, is gradually changing in size as well. And um, it, it's a subtler change, but this, the text size is actually also going to change there you go. right yep. uh, when we hit this break. And you'll see that the, this issue number, which is, you know, very cute, but not exactly necessary on the page, mm -hmm. also disappears alongside this ad. Nice. Yeah. And, and, and it automatically shows up down below that little, the, the issue number uh, 409 then slides down there. Exactly. Okay. And, you know, the page content is reflowed quite nicely. Um, everything is, you know, a bit smaller. And, yeah, the, and you, I know that, you know, a lot of this, such as this text down here, um, as well as this text up here, looks like it's being cut off. That's actually just their stylistic choice. Um, <laughs> you, you'll see even in when we're maximized, you know, it's, it's actually hidden a little bit behind the bar. Okay. Nice assigned choice. So yeah, so that's, you know, one instance of what a media query could look like. Um, the, the Square website, that very famous payment processor, um, is also incredibly beautiful and they do really great responsive design with media queries. So you see this is um, just the full page right now and um, I want you guys to pay attention to a couple of things when we're resizing. Um, one is a couple of these things are first this contact support and log in up here as well as actually this uh, this banner for World AIDS Day. So you'll see when I uh, make this page smaller, you know, things are reflowing as you might expect. But when we hit this break right here, actually, these icons change mm. um, to be, you know, much smaller, perhaps better touch targets if you're on a mobile device. Yep. Um, and some, I guess you would say, more extraneous text um, yeah. it is also being reflowed down here. And you'll also see when we scroll down the page, 
that um, a lot of these items uh, are now aligned in one column, whereas before they you know, had multiple rows depending on the size um, up here. And these are actually uh, similar to the or perhaps same as the inline blocks that we were using before, um, these elements are great because they do reflow for you. So you don't need to do any anything special for that. You can, of course, choose to size them down, size the text down, things like that. But I mean, in terms of the blocks uh, flowing down the page, um, they'll do that on their own, which is great. That's cool. Yeah. So these are, I thought, uh, two really great examples of what really awesome media queries could look like and you know ideas for what you might be able to do or want to do with a media query. But let's actually get on to how to create a query. So a query is composed of a couple of things. Um, the first is the media type. Um, the second are media features. And there are also logical operators. So I know this sounds very vague. I'm going to go into examples of each <laughs> one. Don't worry. Um, I just want you to have an expectation of all the different things that are um, involved in a media query. So the first thing are the media types. So, so uh, there are a lot out there. You know, there are the standards that we expect, like all, meaning all screens, to print, meaning we talked about before, you know, page that is for printing, to screen, which is computer screen, and speech, uh, which is a speech reader. And these are the ones that are the most commonly used. Um, but in addition to that, there are a bunch of other things. Um, there's Braille, embossed, which is for an embossed braille printer, basically. There's also handheld for handheld devices, projection for, you know, that's actually, yeah, projection, yep. TVs, and then also um, TTY, which I never remember what it stands for, but it is the oral um, helper for, for those who are hard of hearing. Right. So um, I bolted the ones up here, the, all the pr print, the screen, and the speech, because those are the ones that people most commonly work with, and probably the, the ones that are uh, most relevant, and the ones that are most supported by different browsers. Right. Yeah. yeah. The one that's on that list that I always like to highlight, because people will gravitate towards it immediately when they first see it, is that handheld, because they immediately think, oh, OK, that must be what I want. The problem with handheld is that it doesn't give you a whole lot of information, that it really is designed for the older style phones, and you really don't want to use it, um, because just because a, a device is handheld doesn't necessarily mean that it's not a rich device. So we want to focus in on, on doing those media queries rather than going for handheld. Yeah, and um, so you can, you know, instead of just querying purely for type, there are also a lot of properties that you can query for, mm -hmm. uh, which end up being much more helpful in determining whether or not a device is, you know, for instance, a, like a touch-enabled um, touch handheld device. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so and so some of the media features that I wanted to highlight were uh, these ones. So again, the top, um, the bolded ones are the ones that you'll most likely be using more of. It's the width and the height of the page. Now, you're not querying for just one specific width or one specific height. You're typically doing a min width, a max width, a min height, or a max height. Right. Um, or you could alternatively use device width and device height, which um, the difference between the two is the, the width and height is basically the width and height of the browser, which may or may not be actually the width of the device uh, or the height of the device, right? Because for instance, I could uh, minimize, a, or, no, not minimize, I could scale down a browser window and I'd have a very small width and height for, the, for that browser window, but my device width and device height are still going to be large, right. um, you know, the size of my entire screen. And you can query for things like that to, to know exactly you know, what you're looking for. Um, there's also orientation. So whether the device is uh, landscape or whether it's in portrait view, um, because you might want to sh reflow content or maybe even like turn content, depending. Yep. Yeah, I've, I've seen uh, one of my favorite little examples of, of the orientation is that if you're in uh, portrait mode, if you're looking at, at a table of, of content, uh, then what will wind up happening is you'll get maybe two columns, and then you flip that to uh, to landscape, and then it will automatically add in a third or a fourth, kind of a little bit more detail there. So kind of a neat little thing that you can do. Um, and again, with CSS, no JavaScript involved. The moment that the browser detects that change, it'll apply that query and, uh, and, and automatically show those columns or hide those columns, respectively. Yeah, and I really like doing things with CSS on mobile because a lot of mobile browsers aren't uh, nearly <laughs> aren't nearly uh, feature compatible with their the desktop equivalents. Absolutely. Um, so it's just, it, these are just 
much more straightforward and much more reliable. Yeah, one of my biggest peeves is opening up a site on, on a mobile device and you know it, it, it takes 15 seconds for it to load up or what'll happen is maybe if it's like a news article, you've scrolled down and then all of a sudden some last little bit of JavaScript fires and then it goes back up to the top again. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the less processing that you can do, the easier things are gonna be. The more that you focus in on CSS, the faster that's, that's gonna take place typically on a mobile browser. Yeah, um, and there are other things that you can query for as well, um, feature-wise, uh, on a device. You know, you can query to see if it's a color device or a monochrome device, but I really haven't seen that many monochrome devices, to be <laughs> honest. Um, you could look for resolution and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, as I said, the, the top four are probably the ones that you're going to be most interested in. And next, I want to talk about some, some logical operators that we can use to, to sort of structure their, these queries. Because you're not going to be looking for necessarily just one thing. Mm -hmm. You're not looking for all screens um, or even you know all things of this minimum height. You might want something that's you know between two things. So so one good example of this is for um, is if you have a large screen, you know or if you have your site, you want it to look one way for a large, you know, perhaps desktop mode. You want something that's slightly smaller, maybe even like, maybe something that's like tablet size or just like half width of a browser. And you also want something that's um, even smaller than that, something like a, like a phone. Um, and it's, it, it's nice when you're in that middle spot to say, you know, I want the max height to be this, and the min, if the max height is this, and the min height is this, so if the height is between these two value uh, variables, I, I want to display this set of CSS properties. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these are um, very good. And I wanted to, so to kind of drive this point home, uh, let's look at some example queries. So the first one we have media, uh, min width 500 pixels. This basically just says uh, if, you know, if the page or the browser is, um, this should be, yeah, so if this if the page width is greater than 500 pixels, so 500 being the minimum, it should display these things. Um, I, I didn't really put any properties in here. This is just, you know, that's, yeah, those are the parameters. The important part. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is just how to query, and then we'll talk later on about um, what are some of the considerations you should put inside of that. Um, the next is what I just talked about, you know, if when you set a min width, and a max width. So basically, if the page width is now between 700 pixels and 960 pixels, what should you do? Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess this is a good point to say, uh, I, I mostly use min width because that that is overwhelmingly the best indicator of sort of someone's screen size. Because yeah. um, to tell you the truth, even sort of device width um, is sometimes finicky and not always supported. It's not always reported accurately. It's not always reported. But min width, I mean, it's the width of the browser. It's pretty not foolproof, but it's it's close. Yeah. Um, and you know, if someone is resizing your page, it, there's still a reason for that, and you want to refill content appropriately. So that's why the min width is there. Um, and you'll notice that I don't have um, sort of a uh, media type on there. And so if you don't have a media type on there, that just applies to sort of all media types. Whereas in the third example, I have media screen and not device aspect ratio uh, 4 over 3. So that says um, as long as this device is a screen, so most yeah. Self-explanatory. If it is basically a screen and the device aspect ratio is not four by three, so if it's not sort of the old school monitor size, then apply these properties. Right. Um, whereas the bottom one is media screen and device aspect ratio, uh, 16 by or nine and 16 by 10. That's, um, so these would just query for these two aspect ratios um, and it would get it would apply only if the aspect ratio is 16 by 9 or 16 by 10. So wide, widescreen devices, right. um, for instance. And so, I mean, these are just some of the common queries you might consider using. I think the device aspect ratio ones are not as useful as sort of the page um, width ones. And in fact, those are the ones that we're going to be working with. And uh, we're actually going to add all, all these into the page that we created in module three. So we're going to make our module three page um, a bit more responsive, it'll resize, uh, elements will resize uh, based on your page width. Perfect. Um, so one last thing is CSS importing before we get to that example. Uh, CSS importing uh, goes hand in hand with media queries because uh, for the most, the only parameter that you can really put in to import other CSS files are essentially media query files. So. Um, 
when I say import CSS, I mean within your CSS file, you can basically call out to another CSS file and include all of those components inside. If this, it's really important to put these in the beginning of your CSS file. That's the only place that they can go. So they have to precede all other elements. Um, and you, you can import them in a couple ways. You can um, import them using the, the URL um, sort of function tag, mm -hmm. or you can just uh, do the straight um, string for, for their location. And these would just be unconditional imports because there are no parameters that we specified. Whereas for um, the, the two subsequent examples, you'll see I'm importing a basic.css for um, basically a print mm -hmm. media type. And so that just you know calls, uh, uses the basic CSS only if this uh, page is, or only if the print media query is triggered. Um, whereas this following one, um, you know, it's it's importing the large screen CSS files for TV or projection media types. So if it's something like a large screen, perhaps you know you want to change up the CSS to make uh, fonts larger, images larger, um, increase contrast, perhaps. Um, that's when you'd use something like that. So I think the import so imports are a nice way to sort of separate out your media queries mm -hmm. from the rest of your. Uh, from the rest of your CSS for, for what your standard page should be. Because CSS can get pretty big as it is. The moment you then start putting in, uh, you start targeting specific device sizes, then it can just get out of control. So it's a nice way to break it down, make it more manageable. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So now that we have covered that, let's actually get started and uh, create some queries on our page. So I'm going to go to, hmm, let's actually start up this page. Do oh man. Open containing folder, and then I'm going to open this. And this is what we left off with. Mm -hmm. um, so as you can see, when we're resizing the page, you know some things are happening. Um, the, the the text is reflowing itself because it's not j jumping off the page because, and that's because we did the max width um, to be 100% of the screen instead of some fixed number. Um, but it's not really getting smaller. This page just kind of becomes less and less usable. When we get over here, uh, the navigation breaks down even. And it's just not very pretty. Although, um, one nice thing is that these inline block elements are automatically reflowing themselves um, in a nice way that it's centered. All right, so we've got you know something going well then. Yeah, we have one thing done, several <laughs> things to go. So um, before we get into how to style all these different things, let's um, let's start by talking about you know what are th some of the different breakpoints that we want for for reflowing this page. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to pick. So let's go over here um, into our code into style at CSS, and I'm just going to uh, I'm just going to put these in line at the bottom here. Um, instead of putting these in different files, because we're not going to do too many. Oh, oops, caps lock. And um, I'm going to start off by doing sor uh, sort of the, the mobile view. So I'm just going to do if the uh, minimum screen width is under um, 700 pixels, that's typically uh, something that you consider a mobile device. Um, there are countless mobile devices out there, but generally their width, um, generally the width is going to be somewhere between you know 690 to like 600, somewhere below 700 pixels. And I think that's a good break point. So uh, which media query should we use? Let's go back here and and see. We have a couple of options, right? We're, we know that these are going to definitely be screens. They're definitely going to be de uh, devices that, you know, computer screens. So we should start with the screen. And then next, we, we have to pick some media features um, that we're going to query this on. Like I said, I'm just going to have this so um, a set of features up here for if the device um, width, or sorry, if the width of the window is under 700. So I can use the, the min device, uh, or the min width property, or the max width property, sorry. And it's going to look something very much like this, except it would be max width, obviously. So so going back here, oh, I'm going to do screen and then max width. Uh, 700 pixels. And then I'm going to put in some properties under there, and then I'm going to give this some comments that say mobile. 
And then we also have that sort of middle ground that we talked about. You know, somewhere between a phone and a desktop, there's a lot. And so I'm going to create something for that. I, I'd say that most desktop pages, um, or you know that something's a rather large desktop when the, the width is generally above like 960. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do some, somewhere between nine, um, 700 pixels and 960 as sort of another a break in our page. Okay. So, so I do sort of the same thing, media, screen, and then I'll set, um, so I need to set both ends. So if the um, min width is above 700 pixels and max width is 960 pixels. And I'm going to set that. I did something bad because it's not syntax highlighting in a way that I want. Is it this? What did I do here? Space. Screen space. Ah, thank you. You're welcome. It might have worked, but it just it didn't look like it would work, <laughs> and that's always a worrying thing. Um, and this is going to be sort of our medium sized. That's not super descriptive, but I think it'll go a long way. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to leave these empty for now because I want to talk about you know, some of the considerations that you want to make in resizing your page. So, decide, so that would be you know, deciding and styling content. The first thing that we do want to do um, is decide on our breaking points. We've already done that. If we've already done that, we want to um, we want a certain look for devices that are probably handheld, something with their width being under 700. And we also want something for um, like a medium sized device, and then our default look will be for uh, basically your standard issue website on a large screen, on a desktop, something like that. Um, some of the important considerations we need to do when we're scaling down is we want to optimize our text. Our text size right now is pretty huge. It, it's definitely heading sized. Um, but as you're scaling down, you don't, I mean, the devices are smaller, the resolution is already higher, but you don't need something that's that large. So we're going to want to scale down our text size. And um, in the same way, we want to scale down our image size as well. Mm -hmm. We only really have one image in there, but I want to scale that down to be smaller and smaller. Um, and actually, you know, w w if it's a really small device, I don't actually need to see that CSS3 logo. Yeah. That is nice. It's something to you know, take up some space on the page, but it's not strictly necessary, right? right? And it's all about sort of finding out what is actually necessary to keep on the page. Mm -hmm. So um, let's say that's not necessarily to keep on the page. We can just hide that element at right. some point. Um, and something else that's important is you know you, um, adjusting your touch targets. We don't have too many touch targets in here, but something that we saw, for example, in the uh, on the Square site is as you're scaling down, instead of having uh, text buttons, they, they switch that down to sort of an easy touch target image button. Um, and it might be nice to actually increase a touch target size mm -hmm. on those elements as well, so that if a user is clicking very close to it, you know that they probably want to click that element, and then you'll, you'll use that as a target as well. Um, it's just nice things to add in that you don't really need to add in for large devices. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and I would actually kind of dovetail off of that with, with two real quick things. Number one, on, on the image, that keep in mind that if you hide it, um, that, that display none on CSS, the image is still sent down. And unfortunately, making an image dynamic isn't as easy as it should be. Um, there are a couple little tricks that you could use with CSS, like a background image, or um, there is eventually going to be an HTML5 picture element that you can use so that you can detect the device size and choose whether or not you actually want to send the image down. But keep in mind that if you just simply say display none, it's still sent down. Now for our conversation, that's fine, but you know, real world, it's something you might want to keep in, in mind. And if I can mention, um, again, you know, going back to another MBA, uh, we actually did an MBA on targeting mobile devices. And so we actually have a full conversation about things like you know, touch targets, implementing touch, and then also going in and showing off the different ways that you can um, change image size based on the device and only send down the right sized image for, uh, for a phone, for a mobile device. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that, in fact, um, something we're going to talk about later, CSS preprocessors, that, that can help a lot as well. Yes. Um, and the import statements, right? So, if, for instance, if you're only importing a certain CSS style to, or c certain CSS style sheet mm -hmm. over to the page for mobile um, and you're importing another one for sort of desktop sites, then um, 
uh, as Chris said, you can use sort of like the background image um, as a URL and yep. to, to get specifically the image that you want. For our purposes, we're just going to do a pretty simple, hey, when the page resizes, the image gets smaller. Um, and that's something that's just um, useful. And the last is uh, to use relative sizing. So relative sizing is something that we already put into our um, that we already put into our page right from the get-go. You know, we had, um, it, just as a reminder, we had margins of 10% sort of on the left and the right. And you mean, when the, when the page scales down, that 10% is going to get smaller and smaller. So we won't be having this like fat 100 pixel border uh, on each side, for instance, uh, when we're on a tiny device. So that, that'll actually get smaller and be sort of relative to the device size. And that's something that's, um, that is incredibly useful to have. As well as what we talked about before, having um, those inline elements that automatically reflow themselves. So useful uh, for if you're, you know, creating something um, that needs to be seen on multiple screens. Yep. So, um, so yeah, so with that in mind, let's actually go through and uh, add in some of those, uh, some of these things to our media queries. So over here, um, let's actually start by doing our, our smallest screen. So, so the mobile slash phone size. Um, when it, Gets to be 700 pixels, and let me actually open this up so we can see. You know, um, oh, one nice thing about sort of developer tools is that when you put it up like this, once I get this page sort of size in a way that's not uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, oh man. <sighs> uh, it's, it's so nice just usually having dual monitors here. Yeah. So you just toss that off to the side. Never mind. I'm going to pin this back. Um, but yeah, you can. You know, if one, you can actually see. Oh, it's not happening on this computer for some reason. But um, you can usually see. There's a way to get this to happen. I can't do it quite right now. Um, to actually see the the width of the page, to see the width of the page right now. Um, do you know how to get that showing? I thought that was automatic. The width of the. Yeah. Um, usually, it shows up. Or uh, let me let me try this. Yeah, it's not showing up right now. Um, on my other computer, it showed up sort of as a, hey, this is 700 pixels right now type thing. Um, but that's OK. Rough, like, roughly when we know that you know, a page is this small, mm -hmm. we don't want a, an image there. We don't need an image there. Like, that's not necessary, right? right? So we can just completely hide that image. And we'll just use a selector for it. Um, it is this CSS image um, ID tag that we used up here. So I'll just do. CSS image, and I'll do a simple display none to hide it. Um, and you know what? We actually probably also don't need this side text. Um, we can just you know ha have our title, mm -hmm. and that be it. So we can also just hide our um, side text in the yeah. same way. One thing that's worth highlighting as, as Helen is, is putting in the CSS is you're going to notice that all that she's doing is taking advantage of that inheritance. Because when she goes in and she sets up that, that media, that's now going to more explicitly define those elements. And so that's now what's going to take precedence. So rather than going in and having to redo everything, she's just going in and targeting the couple of properties that are necessary for that device size, modifying those, making those what it needs to be, and that's it. So you're not going back and redoing a brand new CSS file from scratch. Exactly. Um, and that's also the nice thing about you know including it in in here is you can see those differences exactly. So okay, so I have those two things. But one thing that actually also bothered me is that when it when the screen gets to be this size, um, these don't sit very nicely. And to be honest, I mean the link to the MBA course is much more important than either of our Twitter handles. Hey hey hey! I'm sorry. It's I know. I, I have like two followers on, on Twitter, and, and one of them is my mother, and I don't really think that counts. <laughs> I'm the other one, right? <laughs> yes, and Barry's the other one. <laughs> uh, I, I'll, fo I'll follow you on Twitter if you let me just okay. hide both of us. All right, all right, okay. fair deal. <laughs> yeah. So um, as you can see, a lot of what I'm doing right now is basically just hiding stuff. Um, because once you're on a small sheet, you need to really know what is important on the page, what you need to show, and what you can sort of get away with hiding. So, um, so we're going to hide our our names and I'm and we don't really have actually if you look at the 
um, the code for this. We don't really have you know specific classes for our Twitter handles versus this. It's kind of the same thing, um, or it's the same type of attribute. But what we can do is we can use the pseudo classes, as we talked about before, nice. to just hide um, to just hide the two of our um, handles. So what I'm going to do is sort of same selector as I did before, header, and then descendant, um, list item descendants of that. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to do the not, which I think was uh, briefly brought up. These are just basically, if it's not whatever is in here, then um, then it'll be true, right? Okay. It just negates it. So I'm going to hide everything that's not the first child. Okay. Because if you look on the page, the first thing on the list is the, the link to the site, mm -hmm. and then everything else is just our handle. So I'm going to do not the first child, and then I'll say display none for that as well. Don't worry, I'll, I'll do other things besides display none. I know, right now it's kind of just <laughs> the same thing over and over. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to hide everything that's not the first item of that mm -hmm. list. Yeah, but you know, that display none um, is, is very important, especially when you get into that print. So doing things like just hiding all of those images, hiding the, uh, the navigation, all of that's very important. Yeah, exactly. Um, and one last thing I'm going to do is this text is huge. Um, <laughs> I don't think I should hide it up there, but this is basically three times the normal size. It's 3 EM um, originally, and I'm going to make it something manageable, like 1 EM, like the, the size of general text on the page, especially yeah. since you know it's a smaller screen. Um, and how did I define that? I think I did. I'm going to check to make sure. Banner text is just an ID. Perfect. So I'm going to do banner text. And I'm going to set that. I'm going to set the font size to just be 1 EM. And then now when I save this, and I refresh this little guy. Oh, did I save it? Maybe I'm not on the right page. That's embarrassing. Uh, Demo.html, this is style.css. Just do a real quick control F5. Uh, um, oh, uh, sorry, inside of uh, Visual Studio. Because what that should do is then reopen up the browser for you. Hmm. Um, all right. Well, let's. Hmm. I'm going to think about what could be going wrong right now. Uh, media screen, max width, 700 pixels. That should be fine. Yeah, these. I mean, display none is a pretty straightforward prop for straightforward property. If it's showing up, it should show up. Um, Go back to the browser again. Um, and yeah, just, uh, hmm. And do a control F5 on it, just to make sure. Because I'm wondering if maybe something is cached, and then shrink that down. Interesting, interesting. OK. I'm going to check something. I'm going to check my what it's supposed to be. To see if I did anything wrong. I did. I did. Uh, that's embarrassing. I think I forgot this and here. And maybe that'll fix it. Yeah. OK, there that's you go. it. OK. I forgot the and. <laughs> um. <laughs> that's the demo blow up graphic. <laughs> it's not the worst thing. That's why you have the that's why you have the backup knowledge. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but yeah, so now that you're on a smaller screen, you know, the text is much smaller. But that that's a pretty drastic jump that we did yeah. to go from this page to this with basically no transition in between. So what I'm going to do is actually flash out this part and then I'm going to do this and right here. That way that doesn't blow up. Um, and I'm going to add uh, the properties here that we talked about. Um, it's, I'm actually going to, I'm going to just be lazy, copy a lot of these things over, because these are the elements that I still want to change. Mm -hmm. Maybe not, maybe not these. I think, um, I think our names to stay up there for, yeah. you know, something of the size. We're, we're, we're that important, right? So it's all about, you know, progressively uh, <laughs> removing elements, and we're not there yet. We don't need to remove ourselves yet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yet. Um, so for the CSS image, instead of just doing display none, I'm actually just going to shrink it down a little bit. I'm going to change its width and height. Um, and I'm going, to, so before it was, I think, 300. Now I'm going to do maybe 150, something half the size of its original. 
And for the side text, let's see what I had before. For side text, um, I had font size 1.5 em before, and maybe now I'll just do uh, 1 em. And then for banner text, inset, I don't want it the same size as my font, so I'm going to actually up that back up to 2 em, so it's twice as big, and that, that still looks like a header text. I'm going to save this, and then when I go over here, and I refresh, I'm going to drag this out too. Okay, so, so this is between the 700 pixels and the 960. It'll look like this. As you can see, this, this logo is quite a bit smaller than this original, and so are both of the texts. Um, they're both significantly smaller. So now when you're going from a page of this size to page of this size, you get something that's smaller, and then when you go even smaller, smaller and smaller, you have that sort of progressive degradation of the page. That looks really slick. I like it. Yeah. Um, there are sort of two schools of thought about you know doing these things, um, and the one that uh, one that I just did is you know, start with a fully fleshed page, decide what to take out um, as you go smaller and smaller. But of course, um, a lot of people also just choose to do the opposite. They look, before they build a page or as they're building the page, they say, hey, what are some of the most important elements on that page? And they sort of build for that, like the, that small mobile um, screen the fir first. Yep. And then they sort of say, well, you know, what else can I add? What other information can I add um, until they get to a larger and larger screen? Right. And that's also great as well. Well, I think one good example of this that I saw was um, a weather app. You know, when you're on the smallest screen, you want to basically just show, hey, what is the temperature uh, outside? You know, what is the weather like? And then as the screen gets bigger, you, you can say, this is the humidity outside, this right. is the chance participation, per precipitation. There you precipitation. go. Um, and things like that. And then as you, you know, go full and full on page, and you add like a background image. And I think that's also a really great uh, way of thinking about designing your site as well. It's really, it depends on, you know, the the type of site that you're building. If you're mm -hmm. building something that's you know pretty full content, you maybe want to start, start big, go small. If you're building something that's more like a small lightweight web app, you can start small, go big. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts you have on media queries? No. The um, the only couple of things have, have really just been around uh, images in, in, in the uh, in the chat window. And again, you know, images is just one of those really tricky things. Um, the the one um, uh, little tool that I'm going to highlight here, and uh, actually let me. Um, Bring up, I want, uh, I think it's all one word. Processing. Um, it's my little dance. There we go. OK. Um, perfect. So um, um, Scott, and I'm going to mispronounce his last name, um, uh, Jell? Jell? Sounds, that sounds okay to me. Okay. I'm not so, Scott, though. It, it, Scott J um, <laughs> has this uh, great little tool called um, Picture Fill. And what this will do is it will, regardless of your browser, bring to life the picture element. And what's great about the picture element is it will allow you to identify different um, picture files based on those exact same media queries that Helen just showed off there. Um, and what's important about that is because somebody asked about resizing the image, and in the case of your CSS, um, uh, logo, resizing that makes sense. But resizing a lot of other pictures, just simply shrinking it down, isn't really what we want. That a lot of times what we want to do is focus in on different areas. So just kind of get rid of, of some more of the surrounding areas. So we need different files. That's where that picture element comes into play. This is eventually supposed to become part of HTML, but as anybody who's experienced with HTML can tell you, just because it's supposed to be coming doesn't mean that it's coming anytime soon or will actually happen. So this will, uh, through JavaScript, uh, automatically implement that uh, for you, and it's a, it's a really slick little utility, so I definitely recommend um, checking, uh, checking that out. So, and then uh, beyond that, I think that's about it as far as the, uh, the Q&A goes. Okay, great. So, yeah. So what do you say we uh, take 10 minutes, and then we'll come on back, and we'll actually do two things. I'm actually going to do a real quick aside 
and show off columns just because we haven't done columns yet. And, and I'm sort of feeling a little bad because all of your stuff has been looking really, really good. And my little demo kind of looked a little bit cheesy. So I want to go in and, and kind of finish that out, you know, throw in some columns, which is typically how you'd want something that's that much text to, uh, to display. And then I'll also show off how to implement transitions and uh, resize things as well through, uh, through CSS. But uh, let's take 10, and then we'll come on back and we'll, uh, we'll do all that. So we'll see you guys back here in 10. So by the time all of this is done, I look at Brian and I say, Brian, what are we going to do with all of these lemurs? And he, oh, hey, we're on. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so uh, welcome back. <laughs> this is uh, Adding Style with, uh, with CSS. Uh, and alongside uh, Helen Zhang, I am uh, Christopher Harrison. Now, uh, for those of you who um, uh, are just tuning in, Helen actually has just gone through a series of amazing demos and put together a pretty good looking site. And I'm now feeling a little inferior. Like, you know, the, the pages that I've done up until now have been, you know, really just kind of proof of concept ones. So I at least want to go in and try to gussy things up a little bit and kind of make things look a little bit more uh, real world. And in particular, what I want to do for right now, I'm going to kind of sidestep uh, the, um, uh, the module, although we are going to get into transitions, transformations, so those are really important. And I actually want to focus in on one last little feature that we haven't yet discussed. And and, uh, and talk about how we can get kind of a very typical um, style set up for, uh, for our site. So here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up uh, the little site that I had before, and I still have that, that width of 75%. Of I'm going to go back in and fix that here momentarily. But uh, what I did uh, earlier this morning was I set up our little nav section here with our cool little mouse over, and I did all of that. And then I had the article here, and it was relatively long. And for this demo, I've now shrunk that down. And here's what I'd like to do. And I think this is pretty standard, pretty stock, is I would like over here on the left side to have our navigation. And then over here on the right side, what I would like is I would like columns. So that way, some of our text appears over here, and some of our text appears over there. Wouldn't that be nice? Please say yes so I can do my demo. Yes, and it's very newspaper-like. I mean, when people are reading, or actually when I'm reading, I don't like to read across the entire thing. Yeah, yeah, just down and then down yeah. the other side. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Although when I said that, I felt like I was saying I only read half of sentences because I oh. only read to the middle. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're trying to figure out I just don't like to read the entire line, you know? <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, so let's start off by, by creating this side over here. And one of the things that, uh, that Helen showed off was that cool little float capability. So what I'm going to do is take advantage of that. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to say nav, and uh, we'll put it in lowercase letters. And, you know, I'm actually surprised nobody's asked this, uh, if CSS is case sensitive or not. We almost always get asked that whenever we're doing some form of a language MVA. And uh, the way that I always answer that is treat everything like it's case sensitive. It just makes life a lot easier in the long run. Uh, standard for CSS is to go all lowercase, though, just like with HTML5. OK. In the meantime, so I'm, now I'm going to say nav, and I'm going to say float, um, which is spelled like that, float left. Because again, we want it on the left side. And I come back over here, I hit refresh. And you're going to notice that my navigation section is on the left side, that part's good, but everything else is flowing around it, which is the original design of float. And that's not what I want. That I want this to take over that entire left side. This is where that display of inline block comes into play. So now what I can do is I can say display colon inline block. There we go. Let's hit save. Let's come back over here. Let's hit refresh. Nothing happens because I also need to do it to the text as well to get that straight line. So now let's come back over here and I'm going to say article. And there's my curly braces. And I'm going to say display an inline block. OK. And now let me come back over here, hit refresh. And now we've got that neat little dividing line. I'd like to kind of push everything over here just a little bit. So I'm just going to extend the margin, margin uh, left, and let's set that to oh, let's set that to one um, rem. There we 
There we go. And now let's come back over here. Um, oh, left, right, right. There we go. So you remember back to, to grade school. Of course, I can't do the L on the other hand, <laughs> but when you're learning letters or learning left and right, see L, see it forms an L. So yeah. left, right, and yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, so <laughs> coming back over here, now you're going to notice that uh, that everything is, uh, is is the way that I want it, and I've got my uh, my little links over here on the left side. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to divide this up with columns, but I've got a bit of a problem here because I, I could go in to this article and I could say, all right, well, you know, that looks like it's about half of the text and that looks like it's about half of the text. And I could go in and set up a brand new section and, and just put them next to each other using the exact same um, format that I used a second ago. That would work, but it's not going to work real well when the text changes. Now, what happens if maybe, and let's just come back over here, I go in. And I do something like this that maybe my text magically doubles in size because somebody goes in and copies and pastes. And now I come back over here and I hit refresh, and now you're going to notice that's much bigger. So again, I'm going to have that bit of a problem of how do I create those two columns? And this has been something that we've been wanting for decades now when it comes to HTML, the ability just to say, hey, I want that split up into two columns. Are you ready? Yeah. We can now do this with CSS. I'm going to come back to my article, and I'm now going to say column. Now, you'll notice, first of all, that I've got column count. Mm -hmm. So all I'm going to do is just column count. And you'll notice again, let me zoom in on that. There we go. You'll notice that little pair of scissors that's indicating a snippet to me. So what I'm going to do with that highlighted? Column. There we go. Is I'm just going to go in and say tab tab. Nice. And so that will automatically give me the vendor specific. And I wanted two columns, so I'm just going to say two. And I'm just going to hit the down arrow. And poof, everything is now set to two. So I just come back over here. I hit save. I come back over here. I hit refresh. And now you're going to notice that everything is flowing into two columns. Cool. And you know all the shortcuts. That's impressive. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning so much about Visual Studio from you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm a big, big believer in, uh, in shortcut keys. Um, by the way, where is my little, where's my VW from before? There it is. I want to go in and, and get rid of that. OK. There we go. OK. And you're also going to notice that there is a lot of other column options as well about whether or not you want to um, span columns. There's also uh, different rules uh, that you could go in and, uh, and apply. You can specify the widths. You can put a, a gap between them and so forth. So you can really go in and kind of get full control over, over those columns, how the text is going to flow through all of that and, uh, and so forth. Whoa. Um, um, let me just um, uh, article, and I want width, and I'm going to say 100 BW. Okay. Uh, 1. Why did you work two seconds ago, and now all of a sudden you're not working? You are wonderful. Um, OK, yeah, there we go. There's my little demo. You know, for right now, I, I'm sure it's, it, again, it's one of those little things of I'm just, I'm, I'm sure I'm applying something not quite right. So we'll, I'm just going to put it back to that 75% since it was happy with that. And we'll just kind of leave it there. I figured that'll be good yeah. for the moment. Yeah. I mean, it looks fine. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> OK. Now, if you remember all the way back to this morning, I know that was, that was a while ago. <laughs> But if you remember all the way back, one of the big things that we talked about was wanting this separation of concern. So the HTML is designed to say, hey, this is what our text is. So you'll notice, for example, that I've been using that article and I've been using that section. And what's very interesting about article and section is what they don't do. They don't do anything. That the only thing that they do is simply contain text. And then it's up to you to add the style in on your own using CSS. So we want to use CSS for all of our style. That's what CSS is there for. On top of that, one very big thing that we've uh, sort of highlighted a bit of 
is performance. That up until now, we haven't done a single bit of JavaScript. And bad JavaScript is really what's going to slow your sites down. And so here, very simple little rule here. The fastest JavaScript code is the code you don't write. <laughs> If you can do it, it, Deep Thoughts by Christopher Harrison. Um, if, if, <laughs> if you can do it without JavaScript, do it without JavaScript. Okay, well then let's talk about a couple of different things that we might typically do with JavaScript. And one of them is transformations. That let's say, going back to the article that we had a couple seconds ago, that I wanted to change the color of those uh, little links. Or maybe I wanted to put in a little bit of a background on them. But if I put my mouse over it, it's just automatically going to throw that color onto there. It'd be nice to have a little fade effect. And then when I pull my mouse away, have a little fade effect and have that go away again. Wouldn't that be nice? That sounds beautiful. It sounds a little fantastic. fade in, fade out. Yeah. And you're probably thinking, OK, well, that's going to be dynamic, right? So that must mean JavaScript. Ah, so you were talking about style. So we can do this with CSS. The other very big thing that you might be looking to do is to resize things. So one of the big things that uh, Helen was showing off before with the media queries was going in and resizing different elements or, or hiding different elements. What happens if we want to be able to just globally resize something, just make it bigger, make it smaller? Well, fortunately, we can do that as well with our transformations. And that's actually where we're going to start. That our transformations allow us to take items and manipulate them. So if you want to rotate them, if you want to skew them, if you want to resize them, you can do this all through CSS. Now, because of the fact that this is done with CSS, this can be done with any class, with any element, and with any media query. So if all that you need to do is just simply take a particular div block and resize that down, you can do that without having to go into all the different fonts and all the different sizes and, and calculate everything. You can just simply say, be smaller. And it will be smaller for you. Now, what are some of the different things that we can do? Well, the first thing that we can do is translate. Remember how we've been talking in the past about how it's not always intuitive, some of the names. Translate does mean move. Yeah. At, at least to me, that doesn't scream move. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, once you're out of geometry class for, for more than a year or so, you, you forget the whole translate thing, un unless you deal with CSS exactly. on a regular basis. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we forgot to warn everybody there's going to be math today. We're going to bring everybody <laughs> back to geometry class. So anyway. So what Translate's going to do is it's going to move an element from one location to another. So if we go back to my slide, I spent hours working on this animation. Barry, I want to make sure that I show this off. Are you ready? Here we go. Ooh. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Nicely translated. Yes. Yeah, so it actually yeah, moved it to somewhere else on the page. Now, I, I did the animation mostly just because I wanted to show examples in the slide of, of each one of these, because I'm not going to demo um, each one of these. Um, I threw the animations in. I do want to stress, however, it doesn't work like this out of the box. So sort of like you know, you're, you're watching some commercial for some toy, and it shows it doing something in a little disclaimer down at the very bottom. Toy doesn't actually dance or sing. Um, it doesn't automatically move. But we can you know, do that. So keep in mind that when you set one of these transformations, it's going to apply to that element right then and there. If you want it to transition, we can do that. But that's going to require a transition. And we'll get to that in, uh, in a little while here. Scale is going to resize. So you'll notice here my scale. And ooh, it's going to get bigger. See, there we go. Again, these animations spend hours. Um, rotate. It's going to rotate the element. There we go. And then skew is going to, and I, I, I couldn't make this happen very easily, um, so th there it is. It's going to <laughs> skew it. So you'll notice that my, my little borders here are, are off to the side. Mm -hmm. So those are all the different uh, transformations that, uh, that you can do. Um, and then you can also do none. And there's my animation for none. <laughs> 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 that, that, that did take the longest. Um, the reason that none exists is it gives you the ability just to disable 
everything. That one of the things that can happen sometimes with CSS, especially when you start playing around with things like media queries, is um, something might happen on one media query, and then it doesn't automatically get reset later on. So by my going in and saying uh, transformation none, that will turn off all transformations. So if something else had said something, maybe that property was still applying for one reason or another, this allows me just to turn that right off. OK. So now let's go in and uh, and do all of those uh, all of those different translations. Okay, so there's my uh, there's my uh, little page here, and all I want to do is just resize something. And actually, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep it a little bit simpler on myself. I'm just going to say add, and I'm going to say HTML page, and this is going to be my resize demo, and. Let's just go in and add in a real quick uh, div. And let's give this an ID of resize me. And let's go in and say style. And let's go in and say pound resize me. And I'm going to go in and say um, height. And let's say 100 pixels. And then let's say width. And let's say um, 100 pixels. And now I want to resize that. So what I'm going to do is just simply say transform. And you are going to notice that every single browser has it implemented. Um, and there's vendor specific tags for every single one of them. A lot of browsers, I, I would even venture to say most browsers, do now support just simply transform. And that is. Well, that's kind of cool. Um, and that is what I'm going to use here because it will work. Keep in mind, however, that if you just use transform, older browsers may complain. So uh, just kind of keep that in mind. But now what I'm going to do is I'm just simply going to hit my colon. And you'll notice that there's all of the different um, uh, transformations that, uh, that I can set up here. And you're going to notice on here that there are a few that I didn't actually get in and mention, in particular in the land of 3D. So if you actually want to flip things in a third dimension, you can do that. And you know, there's been a lot of talk about uh, images, you know, and, and kind of dealing with uh, with images. One very big thing that you can do is use SVG graphics, the scalable vector. And so you can actually just go in and declaratively say, hey, this is how I want things. And so by using these little transformations, you can draw the flat surface and then flip that and, and move that backwards and forwards and so forth all on that third dimensional plane. So you can really get pretty advanced with the uh, different transformations uh, that, uh, that are available to you. Um, in my case, though, I'm going to go ahead and say translate. And that's going to give me the ability to move this uh, from, the, uh, from the left and from the top. So I'm going to say 200 pixels and 200 pixels. And then I'm going to add in a resize, whoops, uh, scale rather. There we go. And let's go ahead and scale this. Now, the scale is going to be a number-based percentage. So if you want to double it in size, that means you're going to use the number 2 to scale that. And you can actually scale on both the x and the y axis. And let me actually move this kind of a little bit more center here. So I'm just going to say 400 and 400. There we go. OK. So let's go in and fire this up. Oh, it would help if I set a background color on that. Otherwise, we're just going to wind up with a white box and a white background. Um, background, color, and uh, blue. There we go. And you. Okay. There we nice. go. All right. No comma. That was where my mistake was. So now what you're going to notice is that it has been moved down, moved over, and you're going to notice that it's been resized. Cool. Now, I know what a lot of you are thinking. A lot of you are probably thinking, OK, that's fine and all, but I don't get it. Why in the world am I going to want to just hard code this into a style and just have it be resized? Well, the first big reason is if you are using media queries. So that way, if I do need to resize something for a media query, that allows me to very easily do that. In fact, here, let's just kind of um, do this real quick here, is I'm going to add in uh, my media. And I'm going to say uh, min uh, width colon uh, 500 pixels. There we go. And then let's go in and set that up inside of resize me. So resize me. 
Uh, boop. And boop. And boop. boop. All right. Now, uh, there is my little resize for my, uh, for my mid-width. So, as a result, when it's small, you'll notice small. And then when we get up to big, now you're going to notice that it's bigger. So, it, that's the first big reason why you might decide to, uh, to use that. The second reason that you might decide to go in and use those little translates is this can uh, oftentimes be an easier way to resize things than trying to do everything with JavaScript. Um, so what I can do is combine this with a bit of JavaScript and then just simply set that style property and add in the transform that way. And I'm actually going to get to that at the very end. I know we haven't done any JavaScript, um, but I, I, I I think we'd be remiss if we didn't at least show off a little bit of JavaScript, in particular with jQuery, because so often when you're talking about different jQuery extensions, the way that they're making their magic happen is just by adding and removing classes. So it would be nice to show off kind of how that's done and, and do that with a little bit of resizing. So we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. Okay. Now, that's how we can go in and resize something and move something. How about about making something happen over time. You know, so when I go in and I mouse over something, rather than it just instantly resizing or instantly changing the background color, how about a little bit of easing into it and a little bit of easing out? And, you know, it's, it's funny, and I, I really should go track down this study uh, again. I read this years ago, that what they did was they took the exact same application so it did the exact same thing, and it had the exact same bugs. But they changed the UI on one of them. So one of them was a very simplistic UI, and then the other one was a, a very nice, rich UI. And then they gave them to different users, and they asked them to kind of report their overall feelings and bugs and so forth. And what they found was people reported a lot more bugs on the lesser UI than they did on the fancier. UI. Because if you see a fancier UI, you're going to look at that and you're going to go, oh, okay, well, they've obviously spent a lot of time with this. So, you know, th that little bug that just came up, that must be me. I, I, I must have done something wrong there. And, and I know it sounds sort of silly, but it's true that, you know, perception is reality. How your, your, your users perceive your site, perceive your application is a very important component to the success of it. So those little touches do go a long way. And CSS makes it so easy to add all of those in. And it's going to be done by utilizing transitions. So let's talk about how to add in a transition. Well, what you're going to notice is that if I want to transition, if I want to add on that bit of animation, all that I really need to do is just simply say, hey, I want to add a transition to that property. And I want it to take that long. That's it. So I can still go in and set the exact same key value property. So I can still say background color colon yellow, or I can still say um, size colon and then whatever it is. So I can still go in and do all of that just like I would with normal CSS. And then I just come down here and I say, all right, well, I want to apply that transition to that uh, size property um, or to that color property or whatever else it is that, uh, that it might be. And then on the uh, duration, this is just simply how long I want it to take. That's really it. Now, the delay allows you to just incorporate a little bit of a delay. Just hold off before you go in and make that little change. And then finally, last but not least, is the timing function. And that's going to impact how it's going to kind of start, go in the middle, and then finish. So if I choose linear, it's going to go that same speed throughout. If I go ease, it's going to go slow to start, faster in the middle and then slow to end. And then if I go ease out or ease in, it's going to just go slower at the end or at the beginning, respectively. Now, those are the four options that you're typically going to go for. If you're really feeling like you want a lot more control, you can actually go in and explicitly code how you want things to take place. Um, Again, I've got better things to do with my time. Maybe that, 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 that is something that you want to go in and do. Uh, I generally find that, uh, that the built-in options actually work just fine for me. 
Okay. So with that, let's go in and take a look at, uh, at how we could uh, take advantage of that. And so let's come back to our article here. And on the hover, let's go in and set my background color. And I'm going to set this to be um, yellow. I'm going to start with yellow and just kind of see how I like it. Uh, there we go. All right. All right. Yeah, yellow will work. OK. And I am going to make this a little bit bigger. Zoom, uh, 150. Uh, there we go. OK. So I, I like my little yellow. But you'll notice that the moment I put my mouse over it, it just, boom, now it's, it's yellow. And, and, and that's it. So I would like a little bit of an ease into that. So here's all I have to do. This is it. No JavaScript required. Is I just sneak down here, and I just simply say transition. Now again, you are going to notice it's a code snippet, and you are going to notice again when I go tab tab that it's going to um, add in for every single browser there. So I've got uh, all of those, really, with the exception of Internet Explorer. Um, I'm going to make my life easier, um, and I'm just going to go with transition, which again will work on most browsers. But if you are wanting full support, you should go with the uh, with all the rest of them. I don't think we need to see the same property five times, yeah. though. Yeah. Okay. So. Let's go back in, and I'm going to say transition. And I'm going to say transition property. Let's start here. And I'm just going to say color, or background color. There we go. Perfect. So now I'm saying I want to transition on background color. So the underline will still appear right away. My background color is the one that's now going to have the animation applied to it. If I also want an underline, then I could also go in and say underline as well. In my case, though, I just want background color. All right. And now let's go in and say transition duration. And let's say, I don't know, about 200 milliseconds. That'll probably work. Yeah, let's... that's a little fast, but uh, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. You like that, 500? That sounds good. Half a second. I can see that. Okay. I have really slow reaction time, so I like the longer <laughs> delays. OK, perfect. And let's also add in a little bit of a transition uh, delay. And uh, I'm just going to set that to be uh, 10 milliseconds. And really, all that I'm looking to do there, it's, it's so funny. My, my brain is just hard coded. I'm in CSS. I typed in a number. It must be pixels. Yes. <laughs> um, so in any event, um, what that's really there for is that way if somebody's just simply moving their mouse around, that it's not always going to, to do that. Because if, if somebody's just going like this, there's no reason for me to get all fancy with the animations there. Oh, you don't yeah. want it to create a nice little rainbow? <laughs> I suppose you could. <laughs> All right, so we'll add that in. And then last but not least, it, uh, least is going to be our, um, our timing function. And let's just go in with uh, an ease in. There we go. Cool. So now I hit save. I come back over here. I hit refresh. Ooh. Do it now, again. Yeah. A, yeah. Good transition. Yeah. Now, I am going to make this obnoxiously long here. I'm going to make this five seconds. And the reason that I want to do that is just because it's going to work a little bit better for, for demo purposes. Um, and you'll notice that slowly but surely, it is, in fact, coming into yellow. All right. I would probably not recommend going five seconds <laughs> there. Now, here's the problem that I have, is you're going to notice that if I just pull the mouse away, it goes right back to a white background again. And if you're anything like me, and I know I am, that sort of leaves a little bit of a hollow feeling there. Because we had this really nice animation coming in. It'd be nice if we had that animation going back out again. This is the only slightly bad part, I guess, is you are going to notice I'm just going to need to take this, copy, and then just paste that back into there. So let's just go in. Let's paste that back in. And you know. On the transition out, we should probably go the other direction, um, which is to say that we should probably go slower on, uh, on the out. So I'm just going to go in and I'm going to say out. So now I'm going to save that and I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to hit refresh. And now what you're going to notice is I put my mouse back over. It's slowly going to go into yellow. And then I pull the mouse away and you're going to notice that it's going to slowly go back to white. And what I really love about this is if I do this, so I, I, I put my mouse over, it's coming yellow, 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 and I pull my mouse away. So it didn't get to full yellow. You'll notice that it just picks up right where it was and then starts going back down again. Cool. Very cool. Now, I copied and pasted. 
Um, pop quiz. Mm -hmm. Forgot to warn you there was going to be a pop quiz. Um, CSS stands for what again? Cascading style sheets. Cascading style sheets. So, so these properties cascade. So it's right there in the name, cascade. So an anchor tag is also an anchor hover tag, right? Yes. Cool. So that would mean that if I took away that, that, and that, that that should inherit from up here, right? Yes. Yeah. So let's go ahead, let's hit save, let's come back over here, hit refresh, and now you're going to notice, sure enough, it's coming in, and you'll notice that when I take my mouse away, it's also going out. Because the only thing that was different about how I wanted to do that fade in and fade out was just simply what I wanted to have happen at the end and at the beginning for my regular and for my hover respectively. So I just changed that one property and I let the other ones inherit. So at the end of the day, this is still just CSS. That's great. Um, there's a question, and I think it's a pretty good one. Um, what happens, or can you set different transitions for the same uh, element, like different transition properties? Absolutely. Yeah, so what you could also do is, let's say that I also went with, um, I'm trying to think of something else. I think the underline was a good one. Yeah, okay. So let's, uh, let's go with uh, text um, decoration. There we go. So you'll notice that I could actually add in text decoration as well. So let me go in, save that. Let's go ahead, hit refresh. And yeah, unfortunately, it, I, I don't get a transition on, uh, on underline. Um, what do I want to do? Text color um, or font color? Yeah, there we go. Sure, we'll just go with color. So let's come down here, um, color, colon, and let's go with um, uh, black. And there we go. Let's go with uh, um, black. Uh, color. Cool. Okay. That'll work. Now, let's come back over here. Let me hit refresh. And now what you're going to notice is that, again, over that five seconds, it's now going to um, fade from, from blue to black, and then you'll notice back again. So you can add in multiple. What I would also say is you can set different um, values for the duration, for the delay, and for the timing function as well. So if I want the color to maybe be a bit faster, so let's say that I want that to be uh, maybe at 200 milliseconds. So I want that to be real fast. And I'm going to do this with red, um, just because I think that's going to pop a little bit better here. That I could go in and set my two different sizes. So that 500 milliseconds is going to be for the background color. That 200 milliseconds is going to be for the foreground color or color. Let me go in, hit refresh, and now you're going to notice that it's basically instant. Whoa, no, nope, it's not applying my animation. Um, uh, there. It, well, uh, no, it's not giving me the different values. Why are you not giving me the different values? I might need a I might need a vendor tag on that because it is possible. It is possible for me to go in and set those different speeds. It might just be that I need um, a different uh, a different vendor tag. Yeah, because it's just ignoring it if I do it that way. Um, but in any event, you can go in and apply that to multiple properties, which was really the uh, the question there. Yeah. Okay. Now, let's um kind of keep on keeping on here, and uh, let me bring up. Another little uh, little example that I was kind of building the background here, um, kind of a simple little form. So please register, and there's our little name, our little email, and then our little submit button down at the very bottom. And that's right now a div tag. I want that to be like a button. Yes. So I want to not make the text selectable. I also want to make it so that when you click on it, that it will resize. So maybe kind of condense down just a little bit like you've actually clicked on it. Wouldn't that be cool? That would, yeah, that would be nifty. That would be nifty. Fantastic. OK, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start off by getting rid of the text selection capabilities. So if I, inside of my demo button, just type in the word select, you'll notice that there is a user select here. So I can say user select. And then inside of here, I can say none. Come back over here, hit refresh, and now what you're going to notice is I need my browser-specific um, user select. There we go, and I want none. There we go. Okay, hit refresh, and now you'll notice I'm trying to select and I can't. 
That was cool. Yeah. Very easy. Now, the other thing that I'd like to do is I'd like to get rid of that little um, uh, bar cursor there, and I'd like to change the cursor to be, you know, maybe the crosshair, you know, because it's a button, so you're, you know, focused in on it. It's going to be a crosshair. That's what I'm going to go with. All right. In any event, let's come back over here, hit refresh, and now what you're going to notice is I get that neat little crosshair so I can go in and try to click on that. Now, you'll notice I was able to do all of that with CSS. And again, moral of the entire day is if we can do it with CSS, let's do it with CSS. CSS, unfortunately, doesn't have things like mouse down or mouse up states. Uh. So I'm going to need a little bit of JavaScript. But one of the great things about JavaScript, and, and, and in particular, I want to focus in on jQuery, because jQuery makes this very easy, is the ability for me to add and remove classes. And the vast majority of all the different animations and so forth that you see are all based on the, the addition and removal of classes. That's really it. So let's just create a class, and let's just call it shrink. And let's just go in and say transform. And I'm going to say, in my case, scale. And let's say 0.5 and 0.5. And I'm making that kind of really small there, but yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to you know, prove the point. And then let's go in and say dot uh, grow. And let's go in and say uh, transform. And let's say. Um, none. So we'll just get rid of the, the transformation. And now what I want to do is I just want to, for right now, on my little button, let's start it out with class equals, I'm going to call it default, um, just because I think that's a better name in the long run rather than grow, because I'm just setting it back to the default, don't you think? Yeah. Okay. Setting it to grow I th would make me think that it's growing. Yeah, it's going to get bigger, not that it's just going back yeah. to the original size. Okay. So now, let's um, sneak down here and let's add in a little bit of jQuery here. There we go. And for those of you not familiar with jQuery, we actually, again, have an MVA on, on jQuery. Um, but what jQuery does is it makes it easier through JavaScript to do all of those different things that we sort of take for granted in typical development. So adding on things like click event handlers and so forth is very easy to do in Windows, uh, Windows development, but it's not always as easy as one would hope in JavaScript. So jQuery makes it easier to do things like that. It also does a lot more. But I think that's the easiest way to describe it. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is just simply say script. I'm going to use the shortcut uh, for um, onload. So once the document loads, it's going to run this function. And I'm going to go find my demo button. Why did I camel case that? Um, and then I'm going to say, uh, let's say mouse down. And then on mouse down, I'm going to add in a brand new function. And on that function, I'm just going to grab the button by doing this, dot, and then we'll just simply say toggle class. And let's go in and say um, default and toggle class. And then let's say shrink. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, I, I honestly would do it that way normally, um, but I want to kind of make it a little bit more explicit, um, just kind of call it out here. So let's say remove class default. There we go. And then let's say um, dollar this, um, and let's say um, add class and shrink. There we go. And then let's also just do the opposite. I think you might need the ID selector for demo button. Ah, thank you. I always do that. Yeah. That is that is the number one mistake that I wind up making um, inside of uh, inside of jQuery. Um, and then I want mouse up. There we go. Okay. And ah. cool. There we go. So I'm just swapping those classes. Okay. So now let's go in and hit save. Let's come back over here, hit refresh, and you're going to notice mouse down, it shrinks. Mouse up, it comes back. Very nice. It is. Wouldn't it be nice if it eased into that and eased back out? Yeah. Okay. Well, fortunately, again, CSS 
The C stands for? Cascading. So I can set that property here on the button itself. So regardless of where it's going to get the transition properties applied, it will always work. So I'm just simply gonna say transition uh, duration, and let's go in and say maybe uh, 500 milliseconds. Let's say um, transition property, and that's gonna be transform. Now, transform is just like any other CSS property. So I can use it in media queries, I can use it in classes, I can use it in IDs. Can I use it with transition properties? Yes, because yes, it's just a CSS property. Cool. And then I could also set my um, transition timing function, and then let's just go with an ease, which is um, going to ease in and ease out uh, both. OK. So now, let's come back over here. Let's hit refresh. And now what you're going to notice, ooh, and then release. Ooh. Very nice. Yeah, so just like that, I was able to build all of that. And I really should have added a mouse out as well. So that way, if somebody does that and then pulls the mouse away, it will come back out. But that's OK. You start to see where all of this is going. And what I want to highlight about all of this is the fact that you might look at this and you might think, well, wait a minute. I'm going to add in some interactivity based on a click, based on a mouse down and a mouse up. And so you might be thinking, OK, that should then be in JavaScript. Because after all, that's typically where things like this go, right? It's a, it goes in JavaScript. Well, here's the thing. What are we trying to do? What's the actual end goal? Well, the end goal, the, the, the effect that that mouse down and mouse up is going to have is going to be on the display. It's going to be on the style. And what should be in charge of style? The style sheets, the CSS. There you go, the style sheet, the CSS. So you'll notice that we built everything else into CSS. So how big should it be? How small should it be? All of that was built inside of CSS. And where that also becomes very important is when we start talking about things like, once again, media queries and, and different types of devices. So I might decide for a desktop that that type of a shrink behavior is exactly what I want, but I might decide for a, um, um, for a mobile device, that maybe that's not what I want. So maybe what I do, and I'm not going to go in and, and, and do the full thing here. I just want you to kind of see the point that maybe what I do is I say media and I say um, max width and let's say, um, oh, I don't know, 500 pixels, whatever. Um, so let's go in and, and say that I did, um, I did that. I really should get a colon into there. There we go. Um, so let's say I go in and I do 500 pixels. Then what I could do is I could say um, dot shrink um, dot default, and then just completely turn off any transformations. And I can do that right there inside the style sheet. No logic required inside of JavaScript. And that again goes back to separation of concern. Let CSS worry about how things are going to be displayed. Let JavaScript worry about things like logic and wiring up the event handlers. So now, one little bit right there, no JavaScript required. This is now automatically going to disable that little animation on any smaller device. So very simple for me to go in and, uh, and add that in. That's great. Yeah, very Excellent. useful. Yeah, I'd like to think so. All right, <laughs> the event. So here's what we saw in that module. What we saw in that module is once again how we can take CSS and really kick things up. Uh, and CSS is all about handling the display. This is what we want to use. So hopefully, the biggest thing that you got out of this was not a desire to go running for JavaScript every time that you want to add in something cool. Let the CSS handle the display for you. Let the HTML handle the semantic structure. And let JavaScript do your business logic. All right. What do you say we take 10 minutes, come back, and not talk about CSS? I mean, we'll talk about CSS, but let's talk about uh, preprocessors and how hopefully we can try to clean up uh, our CSS a bit, because obviously it can get very big. Yeah. All right. So let's take 10, and we'll see you guys back here then.
All right, well, for the last time today, welcome back. Uh, alongside Helen Zhang, I'm Christopher Harrison, and this is Adding Style with, uh, with CSS. Now, we've spent a lot of time talking about CSS, obviously. See, it's not just a clever title after all. But one of the things that we've, we've seen, even though a lot of our CSS files have been relatively straightforward, is that those files can get really big. And trying to identify the different elements and all those different properties, that can become very verbose and, and sometimes very tricky and not quite as powerful as, as we might like. Is there something else that we can use? Yeah. Um, he asked as a leading question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think we've. Uh, I think when you, after you play with CSS for a while, you do run into the issue of like, ah, uh, there's a lot of clutter here. This style sheet is getting awfully long. Mm -hmm. um, man, I wish I could reuse some of this code instead of having to copy it over just to you know change some properties. Yep. And that and that's been a burden for a long time. I mean, CSS is, is a relatively old language. So a couple years ago, people have come up with. Um, Various groups have come up with CSS preprocessors, which are, I mean, it's not a different language, mind you. It's more like slightly different syntax for CSS just to help enable you to do more things. So um, there are, you know, three major uh, preprocessors out there. There's less, there's SAS, and there's Stylus, and we're going to talk about sort of some of their differences. Uh, we're going to talk about why they're used, why you need preprocessors, if you need preprocessors, and if you want to use one, uh, which one should you choose? We're also going to go through some simple example usage. Okay. Yeah, so let's start with the big question. What is a preprocessor? Um, the simple way to explain it is that it basically extends uh, your vanilla CSS with extra features. So uh, you've seen us use CSS all day today. I wouldn't say that's everything that's in CSS, but that's the bulk of it. You haven't seen, I mean, you haven't really seen anything with like, variables or with, nest, with us nesting selectors, and that's because those things don't exist in CSS right now. And they're things that people really, really want. I mean, could you imagine instead of you saying, okay, for all of the, I, for all of the um, list items within nav, uh, do this. Instead, you just have do this in nav, and then there, if there are list items underneath, do, do this other thing. That seems pretty intuitive, right? Mm -hmm. But that's actually not something that's within CSS, um, these nesting selectors. And so that's something that's uh, included in every preprocessor out there. I mean, these basically just wrap up the features that people have been asking for in CSS, you know, some loops, some, some variables, some custom functions, uh, maybe some calculation functions for color and math, um, and basically wrapping that up into a preprocessor so that you'll write things in something that looks like, it looks and feels like a better version of CSS, but at the end of the day, it does compile down to standard CSS so that, um, so that it's easy to write, but it's also easy for uh, browsers and clients of the all shapes and sizes to actually be able to use. So it's really making it easy on the developer while still having that same outcome be true for your users, which I think is the best case. Yeah. It does include, of course, an extra step. I mean, you, you write things like this, and then you have to compile them, um, which is not strictly true for one of them. We'll talk about that later. And, uh, and you know, it's this extra step. So there is this question of, you know, do you need a preprocessor? Um, so there is a, so, okay, well, why should you use a preprocessor? Well, it does give you that cleaner, more reusable code. It has all of those flexibility and features that we just talked about. And they actually make a lot of things more uh, easily like cross browser compatible. But if you're just, you know, starting out in CSS, it might be Good. It might be best actually to learn all of the ins and outs of CSS first. Um, if you have a relatively simple page or you have a relatively simple development flow, you don't necessarily need all of that. Right. I mean, if you haven't looked at your code and said, oh man, I could really use a variable here for the background color, maybe you don't need one. Maybe you don't need a preprocessor. And I would never want to push anyone into using a preprocessor if they don't actually need it, um, especially if you're just starting out with CSS. It's good to learn the best practices. I'm not saying you should live through the painful parts to get to the good parts. I'm saying you should see if it's actually necessary in your life. Right. Um, because it's, it is an entire uh, different skill set. And, um, you, and you have to find you know, different documentation, things like that. Oh, another really great thing about uh, preprocessors, actually, that a lot of them come with sort of like mixed, um, these 
things called mixins, or these sort of like libraries of features and components that you can sort of add in. So um, if you guys have used jQuery in the past, you'll notice there are a lot of like other jQuery libraries that are available mm -hmm. for you to you know add in. A, mobile features or sort of um, grid feature or not maybe not grid features that that would I was just making things up. Um, but yeah, mobile features or maybe like canvas features, draw features, things like that. There are also these uh, libraries out there for uh, every preprocessor as well. And those tend to also make things easier because you don't have to write everything yourself. You can reuse code that other people have created that's been tested, that works well. Um, and you can also have more code reuse for yourself. Um, so you know, instead of like defining the same variable a thousand times for, for these different things, you can kind of lump them in together, and you know maybe just call that with a function for a color under each of them. Okay. So it's all under that whole "don't repeat yourself" sort of mindset. Okay. No more copy and paste. No more copy and paste. You've you've seen us do a lot of that today, so you, you know it's necessary. Yeah. And I want you to know it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be true. Right. <laughs> So there are uh, three major preprocessors out there. Um, they're Less, Sass, and Stylus. Um, they all have sort of different philosophies on what what are best practices. Um, they also have you know different advantages and disadvantages. I don't want to go into too much of the nitty gritty today about how do I use each one? How are functions different in each one? Um, but I just want to talk generally as sort of about what their philosophies are, what are some of their advantages, disadvantages, who mm -hmm. benefits from using each one. So yeah, uh, let's start by talking about sort of variables and syntax. As we said before, I mean, basically CSS preprocessors, they're just same language, different syntax, right? right. So, so why not talk about syntax? Um, and for the most part, the syntax is very similar to CSS syntax. You still, um, with the exception of stylus. But okay, let's just start with less for now. In less, uh, you can of course create variables, uh, m like you can in all these preprocessors, and you basically uh, prefix your variables with an at sign, with an at symbol, so you know that those are variables and not just properties. Um, and you assign those, and you assign values to those variables or to whatever else with a colon, much like you do in CSS. In fact, the uh, the syntax of less is most like CSS, and um, this even gets, this even extends down to you know, how they create how they create like loops and things like that, which does actually make it a bit less intuitive um, to users than than things than if you had sort of a more JavaScript like um, directive. So, for instance, um, you when you're saying, "Hey, uh, apply this property if this is true," um, you, you're saying, "Apply this property when this is true." And they wanted to style that sort of after the way media queries are styled, um, which I mean, their entire philosophy is, "What would CSS do?" Basically, <laughs> what would CSS do if it did all of these features that we wanted. And that's sort of its philosophy. Um, for SAS, variables are prefixed as well, but they're prefixed with a dollar sign instead. So it's, it's a bit more you know, JavaScript-like. And values are still assigned with the colon. Um, the syntax is pretty similar to CSS, just like uh, less, um, but they have more like JavaScript-like directives. So if you're wanting to use an if, um, there's actually something uh, there's actually an if function that you can call. Um, and there are you know, loops that you can call, like while loops, for loops, et cetera. Whereas that doesn't exist as much in less, because less is of the opinion that hey, that's not a thing that CSS would do. Like We don't really want to do that. But there are ways that you could do that. Um, you can call a recursive function to call itself. And it's more complicated. Mm -hmm. right? um, and so I guess the difference between those two are just that CS, um, less is more CSS-like in syntax slightly, and SAS is more JavaScript-like in syntax. And you can even see that with you know variables being prefixed with a dollar sign. That's very jQuery-like, which is something yeah. that we're all sort of used to. Um, and stylus is sort of the one that's a bit different. Um, variables don't need prefixes in stylus. If you want a variable, you basically you just say uh, you know x equals something, and there you have it. You have a variable. Their syntax generally is um, very, very minimal. So uh, so I said this is most similar to JavaScript. This is, this is true in the sense that you can have, so like in JavaScript, perhaps this is 
no, this is a little known fact, but you mean you don't necessarily need semicolons. You should definitely have them. But you know, JavaScript, <laughs> like if you leave off a semicolon, it's not the end of the world. It really is, yeah. Outside of just a few edge cases, JavaScript will work just fine without semicolons. Yeah. Still have them though. Yeah, exactly. Don't don't take that for an endorsement to not have them. <laughs> but I mean, in terms of variables being assigned with equal signs, in terms of variables like not needing prefixes, it's just very simple. And in fact, I would say the syntax is not just similar to JavaScript, it's extremely, extremely similar to CoffeeScript. So if you're someone who you know, has used Ruby before, you really like CoffeeScript, or you just, you're just you like a really concise person and you want your code to be the smallest possible that gives you that like really good feeling, yeah, Stylus is probably for you <laughs> because it is by far the least verbose. Um, it's worth mentioning that Stylus will, of course, process your code properly um, if you have the full CSS syntax. Um, so style doesn't need curly braces, but if you add curly braces in, it's fine. See, um, it doesn't need semicolons, but if you add semicolons, it's fine. It all basically works on indentation uh, more than anything else. So I guess I should have really said it's more, most similar to CoffeeScript, not JavaScript itself. Um, so in terms of writing in these different uh, syntaxes, I should say, in these different preprocessors. I would say th um, that's the, those are the differences. Less is most similar to CSS, SAS is most similar to JavaScript, and Stylus is most similar to CoffeeScript. It's like most concise by far. And I'll show you an example usage of all this. I'll actually um, show you how code, or how my earlier CSS code looks refactored into this. Um, so let's do that. I realize now that I closed Visual Studio earlier, so I just need to bring up my old files. Hopefully that is not too hard. Oh, it's really not. Um, I called it preprocessor, that's CSS. And I'm going to bring up my original style, that's CSS, just for comparison. Um, right, okay, so this first part is the, the last less syntax. Now, right off the bat, uh, what we talked about is that you can have variables, and those variables mm -hmm. are prefixed with an at symbol. I mean, this is sort of a basic variable. I just um, use it for background color for the header. Um, and you basically, you assign the variable in the beginning, um, and you can use it here. The variables for all of these work in much the same way. They're all sort of scoped in the way that uh, variables are scoped in JavaScript. So you know, if something is defined within header, um, that that's used first, and then if it's not, it's you know, it cascades. Up, okay. I suppose. So yeah. Um, but what you can see here is that this looks an awful lot like CSS. I mean, if you look over here, you look over here, it's it's very similar. So so what are the differences? Well, the the major difference, besides the fact that I apparently cut off all of body, is uh, that. <laughs> In, in here, in header, you see how in header, even though I put um, these elements nested under header, they're not actually nested within this header block. Right. Right. Whereas in, whereas in this less syntax, um, I don't need that header to be prefixed before the li because it's saying, because if this li item is within this header block right here, um, then that list item then it automatically does sort of the, this is, if this is a descendant list item of header, then do these things. Okay, so the header winds up becoming the container, and then you can set, hey, if it's inside of there, this is how I want you to look. Yeah, and okay. I mean, these two things, sort of the variables and this nested syntax, are some of the most frustrating things, um, which is why we have them in here. And um, it, and I did the same for the, the link elements here, and you'll actually notice um, I have this and percent here. This uh, refers to basically a parent. So the parent of this is this this A here. Um, and so this basically just translates that over. If I had this up here, um, then this would refer to header. And that just says, hey, have the answer to this do this. It doesn't look very shortened since uh, it's only replacing an A. But believe me, if this was, you know, um, like a much larger selector, much more complex selector, you'll be thankful that it's sort of there and that it's more concise. So, so that's what this syntax looks like for less. And uh, if you scroll down a little bit, this is what the syntax looks like for SAS. Um, I didn't mention this earlier, but I, I'm going to mention this now. SAS actually had um, SAS actually has two sort of syntaxes. There's there's SAS. So if you're um, writing SAS files, you can end things into extensions, .sass or .scss, which is sassy CSS. They're, they're very sassy. Um, I, I, I see what you did there. 
<laughs> there, I, you know, I have to say up to now, I'm, I'm very disappointed. I haven't done my, my standard less is more joke just because I haven't found the right opportunity. So I, I, I will throw that pun in a little bit later. <laughs> So, in any event. Yeah. I mean, SAS is, uh, I think SAS, just by virtue of their organization name, has the best slash most puns. Um, <laughs> they were, you know, throwing out conference names like Keeping It Sassy 2014, things like that. It's, it's cute. I, I mean, if CSS is all about style, SAS has a lot of style. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, right. What I was talking before is um, SAS has two, uh, two sort of syntax styles. Um, and this branched off a couple of years ago. But this is the preferred style that's sort of more verbose, is the more preferred SAS style. And they also have one that's much less verbose, much more stylist-like. But that's not nearly as much in use anymore. Um, and they sort of thought, oh, maybe this is what people want, but then they kind of went back to, to their original format. Um, so, so occasionally you'll see you know, SAS examples be extremely concise, and that's the reason why. It's because there were these two formats, but this is the, I wouldn't say it's a canonical, but I would say it's a preferred. Mm -hmm. But um, if you compare this SAS syntax now with the less syntax up here, it looks exactly the same, uh, with the exception of this. So the only real difference that you can see here is that, hey, there's a uh, dollar, symbol, dollar sign here for uh, you know, denoting a variable instead of that at symbol. But um, other than that, yeah, it's, it's used here. It's still a dollar symbol. Um, the, it nests in the same way. The mm -hmm. list item, the A are all under header. And even the and percent, sort of the placeholder for parent element, is the same. Um, so right now, there, there are not a lot of syntactical differences, I think, on a very basic level. Um, and I think, so if you're trying to choose on syntax, um, SAS and LESS so far come out like, fairly evenly. But if we come down here and we look at Silas, whoa, that looks way different. <laughs> um, that looks very different. Yeah. No curly braces. No curly braces at all. Um, there's not. No, there are no semicolons ending these lines. You don't even need. Um, you don't actually even need the colon in between uh, oh, sort wow. of the property and the value. It's, That's really weird. Yeah, you basically don't need to write anything. I, I left one in here. Um, I'm going to pretend like I left that in here because, as I said, you can, but I actually just forgot to delete it out. Um, but yeah, it's extremely concise. You don't need like these semicolons. Um, you don't need very much at all. And again, it nests in the same way. It all is just based on indentation now instead of the curly braces. Um, but you know, we like to have a good indentation anyway. And uh, again, you know, the, the sort of parent placeholder is still the ampersand. That's just the preferred way to do that in mm -hmm. um, all preprocessors. So yeah, syn syntactically, this seems really lightweight, right? I mean, it seems yeah. there are many. Uh, there's so many less lines than there are for these other ones. But again, this is not nearly as much like CSS as the other ones, even though they're all compiled down to pretty much the same thing. They'll compile down to something that looks like this. Um, yeah, if, you're, if syntax is something that's important to you, these, this is how they might look different. So with syntax out of the way, I mean, there, that's not the only consideration. Um, whoa. Sorry, there are also a lot of general differences um, between sort of the three uh, big preprocessors. So let's start with who has the largest community. SAS by far has the largest community. Which, okay. Yeah, and so and that's um, due in part to a couple of different things. Um, Less has um, a community that's quite large as well. It's I mean SAS and Less are always neck and neck, um, and then Stylus is is smaller, but I, but their following is very loyal, um, just because it, I mean, it's specific for a reason, right? People who love CoffeeScript, who love Ruby, love Stylus because it has all of those things that they're looking for in their syntax. It's concise, it's short, it's exactly like what they have. You don't need all those pesky things if you don't want them, um, syntactically speaking. But it's still really full featured. So SAS has the largest feature set. And by that, I mean you know, it has all the loops that you're looking for. It has ifs, it has whiles, it has for loops, it has, um, it has conditional uh, like mix-ins, it has all of these different things. Um, and basically, you know, if, if someone can, this is not strictly true, I'm exaggerating here, but essentially if there's a new feature that 
they think will be useful, they'll include it in SAS. So it's extremely versatile. And added to that, it's supported by um, something called Compass, which is basically like a CSS framework slash library uh, for SAS. So that um, so you can you know import. So that's already a repository of all these popular mixins, uh, which are basically like snippets of code that you can then inject in. So you can say, for instance, um, I want. Uh, you have you know three different classes, and you want sort of fo like font to be red, the text to be large, something something else. You don't want that to be added as a class. You can add that as a mixin in three different classes. So you define it once, and then you basically inject it in these other ones. Um, and that's like the most basic type of mixin. There are also you know, crazy huge ones that you can get from these library um, that do a lot of you know the CSS heavy lifting for you, such as like anything from you know aligning your grids to doing resets to whatever else. And Compass has is a repository of all of these different mixins. So you have this really robust sort of support network of um, of features of these other things that you can use, much like sort of the jQuery community. Except the jQuery community is actually pretty disparate, right? There's not like really one repository that you can go to to say, hey, I want a mixin. Um, I suppose then SAS is much more like NPM. It's like the node package manager, right? Or like any package manager. You say what you want, you go in, there's probably a million things for that, <laughs> and you can get it from this one centralized place. Whereas um, less also has a lot of mixins. Mixins are available in all of these different things, but um, the, you can't. There's no central repository for less mixins. Um, there's, you know, some guy over here created something. Some guy over here created something. You can go to their sites. You can download them. And there have been some. Um, and there are some libraries uh, for less mixin libraries for less, but they're not. Um, it's, since it's not centralized, and since there's two or three of them out there, it's not really as sort of easy to use. You have to search in different places for different things, and there's no clear winner yet. Um, but it is, and less has like less features than SAS. I mean, I don't mean to say that in a bad way, because SAS, because less is actually really careful and conservative about the features that they do put in. So they don't try to put in anything extraneous. As I said before, mm -hmm. um, less wants to do what CSS would do. You write less like you would write CSS. CSS wouldn't put in loops. Less doesn't have loops. If you want to do loops, you can, but you know it's not recommended. So it's really the most true. And when CSS like implements new things, it does tend to be very less like. So I mean, see, so less is more. Less is more. Yes, I managed to work that in. Go me. Nice. Um, and we've talked a lot about Bootstrap today. Mm -hmm. And so Bootstrap um, is actually built on top of less. It does work with SAS, but um, actually, you know, the creators of Bootstrap wrote all of their CSS things in less, and that's how it's compiled. Right. And so you can actually access all of those less files. Um, and you know, modify them, and it has a really large following because of its really close tie to Bootstrap, um, among other things. Mm -hmm. And as I said, it, it does work beautifully, and it doesn't lack any features that you want. I mean, it, it just lacks sort of like some niche features that are nice to have. And the one really cool thing about Less uh, is that it can be run in the browser. Really? I'm, I'm going to let that hang for a second because that sounds really confusing. Like, what do you mean it can? Right. run in the browser. Um, CSS runs in the browser. Well, I'm going to show you sort of how that works. So I don't have a compiled less file uh, for this. And no, I don't no. actually have, oh, sorry? Oh, no, go ahead. I, I was just simply going to mention, a lot of people have asked actually kind of two questions. Number one is about um, Visual Studio support. So which uh, of those three does Visual Studio give you support for? Um, I know for sure that Visual Studio supports less. I don't know about the other one. It does do SAS. Um, it doesn't do Stylus. OK. Yeah, it doesn't do Stylus. So. And then uh, a lot of other people are asking, OK, so you go and you create the less file. How about actually then uh, um, compiling, uh, compiling that into CSS? Um, there are compile. So wh when you go on to the less site or to the SAS site, um, they'll have instructions for you know how to download this. And I can actually show you what that looks like on their site. So you have like pretty robust instructions. Um, what I'm going to show you in a bit after I show you this is how you don't actually have to do that. So SAS has um, a compiler that you can install and has command line. You have to really run these yourself to like compile these files down. And for the most part, it's it's true for less. It's definitely true for Stylus. But um, there are also 
things that you can use, um, these projects that people have built to automatically compile files down right. when you're running. And uh, there's, there's a million third party things like that out there to make your life easier. But uh, less is special because you don't have to do that. And so um, I'm going to, so theoretically, if I had just a less spreadsheet ending in dot less, this is what I would do just in my HTML file. I would say instead of text slash CSS, I would say text slash less. And then in, over here, instead of style.css, let's pretend my file was called style.less. OK. Right? And then um, less actually has a less.js that you can include in here. Um, if you go to their site, uh, less.org. It's loading, it's loading. Um, <laughs> And you can actually see they have this client side usage. There's a there's this less.js that you can download, and you basically just include that as a file like this, assuming it had it in here, of course. Right. So so you would download that or pull it maybe from a CDN. Yeah. Okay. And if once you have these two things in here, um, it'll automatically just uh, it won't compile, but it'll convert all your code over, um, and so all your CSS styles that you wrote in less will just work out of the box, which is super cool. It's not performance at all. It's nice for <laughs> testing. Um, right. Yeah, they say, you know, hey, you can, you can use like this client, you have client side usage, but even they say, hey, we re recommend pre-compiling first. Okay. But it's nice for testing. I mean, it's, it's so straightforward. And right. if you want to just sort of try a preprocessor out without installing other things, hey, you only need two files. You need a file of, that, of less that you wrote yourself, and you need sort of the less script. OK. Um, so it's very cool. And Stylus uh, is something that you have to compile yourself, uh, much like less. So there's n nothing as cool about that, um, or nothing mm -hmm. as cool in SAS and Stylus for the browser um, so Which, there's no Java preprocessor exactly. or, or, or JavaScript preprocessor yeah. for, well, for SAS or stuff. Yeah, exactly. Or there's nothing that's sort of first party easy to use. Um, that you can compile things yourself. Um, if you're you know, writing a JavaScript project um, and you're using Grunt, something like that, mm -hmm. um, it already do that for you for the most part. So it's not something that you work that you have to worry about too much. It's not a crazy heavy thing. And I think that's one of the reasons um, you know I go back and say, hey, you don't actually need a preprocessor. If you're someone that's you know writing sort of one CSS file and you you want to try things out, that's nice. Um, and please do that because these preprocessors are great, and I really want you to try them out. And so, if you go on to do a bigger project, you already know how to use them. But for the most part, um, you know, these are used in like larger scale projects so that you can import actually different styles um, into one document in an easier way than the import that we saw before. Right. Uh, you can you can add in mixins from different files. You can have these different directives, um, and. And when you're compiling down the project, if you're already using something like Grunt or like Gulp, um, that'll do all of that compiling for you. And mm -hmm. it's not something that you have to worry as much about. So lastly, I guess we should talk about, hey, I mean, there are these three preprocessors. Helen said a couple of things about each <laughs> one. She, and they all seem to have like pretty strong advantages, right? right. Less, um, it can be run in the browser. It's super compatible with Bootstrap. Um, it's it's very like CSS. That's great. Um, SAS is so fully featured. Anything you want to do, you can do. And there's already a great, you know, network of support with Compass. Um, and Stylus is just easy to write. It's like a pleasure to just you know <laughs> type out a couple of words, indent it, and um, have that be your style sheet. So. They all have their distinct advantages, but what you should think about first is, do you really need a preprocessor? Mm -hmm. If you're working on a small project, um, if, you're, if you're not doing anything that's too complex UI-wise, maybe you don't need a preprocessor at all. And if you do want to use a preprocessor and you're thinking about trying one of these out, well, think about what technologies are you already using? If you're someone that's already using Ruby or CoffeeScript, it's probably a no-brainer. You're going to use Stylus because, hey, the syntax is just so similar to what I'm already doing, and it's not confusing me, and I don't have to get into a different mindset. <laughs> um, if SAS is super compatible with Ruby, and you, know, you can compile things down with Ruby, it's built in Ruby, so that's something that, that you might want to consider. Hey, if you're a Rubyist, SAS is a great way to go. Um, whereas less is, you know, comp uh, it's 
natively compiled with NPM. Um, so if you're like a straight JavaScript person, maybe maybe you want that. Uh, maybe you're already using NPM, right? And um, if you're just you know more conservative in your code writing, maybe that's something that is good too. So yeah. What technologies are you using? That'll inform sort of what your preferences are with the ease of use for all of these preprocessors. And the last one is, um, I said, do you prefer declarative or imperative programming? Which sounds like a very like loaded question. <laughs> um, that, that's the huge question to ask because, and I mean, that basically boils down to like, how do you want to write your loops? How do you want to sort of go into these conditionals? Um, I would say that the way that you write these in less is almost like functional programming. Right. Um, you know, in that you have these conditions that you'll go into, like when this happens, do this. Um, whereas uh, SAS and Silence are much more the traditional sort of like the character programming way where you say, hey, um, if this happens, do this. Right? If one appeals to you more than the other, and this. Uh, Again, goes back to what technologies do you already use? Um, then that is a really great way to sort of pick the preprocessors that you want as well. Because um, to be honest, I love SAS, and and I would pick SAS as like my preferred. Except I just the the, uh, the uh, control directives give me so much trouble. It's it's really just not intuitive for me. So uh, I prefer something like like SAS instead. But that's not necessarily the same for other people, and that's certainly not necessarily the same for you. OK. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's sort of you know the different preprocessors that we have, and that, or not that we have, that the world has. Right, that are available. Uh, yeah, the major yeah. ones that are available, should I say. There are also um, other ones. There are also a lot of just general things in the CSS community that you can use. In mm -hmm. the CSS world, there's not only preprocessors, there's even like postprocessors that you might be able to use. I won't even get into those. <laughs> there are also CSS frameworks um, mm -hmm. that, that you can use to sort of do a lot of your grids, a lot of your resetting. Um, some really great ones, I think, uh, that, that are popular out there. Bootstrap is obviously a great framework. Yep. Um, it does a lot of CSS as well as JavaScript. Yep. There's also Reset. There's HTML5 Boilerplate. And they're all just <laughs> a lot of great resources out there. Yeah. Um, if you're you know, thinking, uh, if you're thinking about you know, embarking on a new CSS project. Yep. There's no real reason to do everything from scratch like we did today. <laughs> And I would, in fact, recommend that you probably sh don't do everything from scratch. Yeah, and, and, and one thing to mention, just so you don't um, uh, hear that and go, oh, well, then you know, did I just waste the entire day? Um, you know, when you're trying to learn something, um, it's, it really is best just to get it down to its barest components and, and build at it that way, which is why we did everything from scratch, because we really did want to show, hey, look, this is it you know, all by itself, kind of keep it relatively simple, so that way when you do need to go in and, and tweak something, that you know how. Um, but what Helen said is 100% is correct, which is, you really don't want to sit down and just start writing from scratch. You know, take a look at Bootstrap. There's a great MVA on Bootstrap, um, but take a look at, uh, at at Bootstrap. Take a look at the other frameworks that uh, that are available. Um, that after all, the best code in the world is the code that's already written. Or as a friend of mine likes to say, uh, we're not launching rockets here. And the point that he's making when he says that is, whatever it is that you're doing, somebody else has already done. So if you're trying to create an admin site, an e-commerce site, um, uh, an informational site. Other people have done that. Take advantage of, of, of what's already out there. So go find a framework that you really like, and then use the, the, the tools, use the skills that you've learned today to go in and make those tweaks so that you can put your own personal touch on it and, and make it your site so that way your site doesn't look like every other bootstrap site that, uh, that's out there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really, I think, the sort of the the moral of of the story, the story, and, and really, I think, the moral of uh, of today. Yeah. So, fantastic. All right. Well, first of all, uh, for everybody that stuck with us for uh, for the entire day, um, thank you so much. Um, hopefully, you guys had uh, had as much fun as uh, as we did. Um, second of all, is uh, I do want to highlight because a lot of people have asked this about the uh, the source code that we've been playing around with. Um, we've uh, all of um, uh, Helen's demos are already checked in, and one thing that I would note is because a couple of people asked about this, the earlier demos that she was doing about um, adding that last little bit of 
style onto the site, you have both the, the starting point and the ending point. So that way people can go in and, and, and look at all of those. I checked in all of uh, my demos, and they're all available right there at uh, github.com slash geek trainer slash CSS dash style. Um, and for those of you that maybe aren't familiar with GitHub, uh, I'll uh, highlight the fact that right down there at the bottom is download zip. So if you just want to go grab everything, that's all that you have to do, and you don't have to install um, a GitHub client or, or anything else like that. Um, the other big thing is uh, you'll notice down at the uh, very bottom of the screen, there's the one last little poll question about um, uh, how much you liked us. Please do take two seconds and, uh, and choose an option from, uh, from there. And uh, one last time, um, that is uh, Helen Zhang. Uh, I am um, uh, Christopher Harrison. And normally I have this thing where I, I would usually close out and, and, and shake your hand. I'm not going to shake your hand today. I hope you don't take offense at That's that. That's okay. We can, okay. Uh, you, can you do a fist bump yeah. with the other hand? Yeah, there we go. We yeah. can do a fist bump. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. So with that, uh, do you want to thank you guys? You are HZW? HWZ. HWZ on Twitter, and I am, of course, Geek Trainer. Um, come find us, and uh, thanks again for, uh, for tuning in. Yeah. Bye.